and co we debate we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome especially yours gb news the people's channel britain's news channel 2024 a battleground year the year the nation decides as the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election who will be left standing when the british people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives who will rise and who will fall let's find out together for every moment the highs the lows the twists and turns we'll be with you for every step of this journey in 2024 gb news is britain's election channel I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Time approaching six o'clock on this Tuesday morning. Very good to have you on board. It is the 16th of April, and this is Breakfast with Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster on uh, GB News. Thanks for joining us. Our top story this morning, Liz Truss is back with a new book. She's calling it 10 Years to Save the West, and she tells all about her time in government. I hate being told what to do. Yeah, I know. And I hate the government telling other people uh, what to do. And having well, spent 10 years in the government, I can tell you it generally doesn't know best. Well, as you can see, Liz Truss did not hold back last night. What will her words mean for Rishi Sunak? Find out more with me very soon. Suella Braverman slams the Prime Minister for lacking the political will to ditch the ECHR as the Rwanda bill heads back to the House of Lords. The West calls for restraint as Israel vows to respond over Iran's weekend attacks. And the PM continues to resist calls to prescribe Iran's revolutionary guard. A sleepy Donald Trump becomes the first American president to face a criminal trial over his hush money case against porn star Stormy Daniels. And the National Trust has come under fire from locals as they're accused of seizing sports land for biodiversity spaces. And a sleepy Paul Coit has the sports news for you. Cole Palmer scores the perfect hat trick, one with the left, one with the right, one with the head, as Chelsea puts six past Everton. The Champions League starts again tonight. It's getting exciting, and the band athlete that looks likely to compete for Team GB in the Paris Olympics. A chilly start again out there this morning, and like yesterday, there will be a fair few April showers around, but the winds will be easing down. There should be a bit more sunshine today, so feeling a little bit warmer. Join me later for a full forecast. She was the shortest um, reigning British Prime Minister ever. 
49 Days for Liz Truss, but uh, her book, 10 Days to Save the West, comes out today telling that story. Well, in her book, Truss claims she was the only Conservative in the room as she explores her time in government from Foreign Secretary to, briefly, Prime Minister. Well, last night she spoke with Nigel Farage. Here's what she had to say. I was the only Conservative in the room yeah. for many years, and it's not working. You know, the West is weak. Uh, we're seeing authoritarian regimes on the, on the rise. And what we're also seeing is in our own societies our very values being undermined. You know, the things we believe in, our nation, the family, individual freedom, all of those core values are being undermined, and that is what my book is about. I hate being told what to do. Yeah, I know. And I hate more. the government telling other people uh, what to do. And having well. spent 10 years in the government, I can tell you it generally doesn't know best. We've had a white hall that's been shaped by being in Europe, you know, essentially supplicants to Europe. And... It's almost like, what is that syndrome when you become a hostage and you start to love Stockholm. your... Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. It's almost like that. You know, mm. Officials are constantly looking to Brussels for validation. And it, all of that needed to change. Just part of uh, what she had to say. She's got more to say tonight on GB News. Let's go to her political correspondent, Olivia Utley. Olivia, for your take on this. Well, it's very interesting what Liz Truss was saying last night. We often hear uh, politicians in Westminster, particularly Conservative politicians, complain about what they call the blob, the sort of civil servants and technocrats who they believe are actually running Britain. Liz Truss almost sort of takes that a step further. She suggests that politicians now have almost no power at all. And I suppose that explains uh, for her the reasons why her premiership wasn't a huge success. She suggests that Britain should get out of the ECHR. Well, that's something that quite a lot of Conservative MPs agree with. But she also thinks we should scrap the uh, Office for Budget responsibility and the Supreme Court as well. She believes that these sort of technocratic institutions, these uh, non-government, non-political uh, non institutions, are actually what's running the country. And I expect there will be quite a lot of sympathy for that position within the Conservative Party. Liz Truss knows that. She's trying to get some support on side. Lots of people in the Conservative Party essentially think that whoever the next Prime Minister is, his or her hands will be tied because of these institutions which New Labour gave so much power to. It'll be really interesting to see if Rishi Sunak responds to any of this, because some of the problems that, Rishi, that Liz Truss is talking about about. He is certainly facing too. The ECHR is one of the main reasons why his Rwanda legislation isn't yet off the ground. Will he respond? Will he hit back? Or will he actually agree with some of what she says? Yeah, and, and whether or not he, he sees what she's saying as undermining him. I mean, he laughed, didn't he, when she was talking at the CPAC convention in the United States about Britain being part of the deep state. I mean, she'd been prime minister uh, just over a year ago, um, and he was sort of uh, laughing that off. But interesting you mention uh, Rwanda there. Suella Bravman also lining up to criticise the prime minister, saying that he lacks the political will to pull out of the ECHR. Um, how will he feel about that, do you think? I think Rishi Sunak is going to find that very difficult because there are now plenty of very senior Conservative politicians who are openly telling journalists that they would like to see Britain get out of the ECHR. I think that it is not impossible that Rishi Sunak actually puts getting out of the ECHR on the Conservative manifesto, depending on what happens with this Rwanda legislation. It's going through the final hurdles in the Commons this week. We are very much expecting it to pass. But after that, there will be legal challenges. And if if Rishi Sunak fails in his mission to get flights off the ground by the spring because of any uh, legal challenges to that bill, then he might start moving towards the leaving the ECHR position. 50% of Conservative voters from the 2019 election would like to see Britain leave the ECHR. Right, Olivia, what is um, Liz Truss's game with all of this, with this book and this series of interviews that she's doing? Uh, does she intend to stand at the next election, for instance? Is she positioning herself for a comeback? 
Well, my instinct is that what she's probably positioning herself for is this sort of career overseas in the US, assuming that Donald Trump becomes president. I mean, that is a, a big assumption. But if Donald Trump does become president, then Liz Truss's sort of worldview, Liz Truss's uh, fear of the of the deep state, this idea that sort of technocrats are running the world and politicians need to take back control and take back uh, dis- take back take back decisions for their nation. Those ec- those ideas would all echo pretty well with a Donald Trump presidency. Back here in the UK, I would suggest, at the moment at least, there isn't much of an appetite for uh, a Liz Truss comeback. There will be lots of politicians who very much agree with what she has to say, that the kind of blob or the deep state, as she puts it, is running the country. But Liz Truss as a sort of foreman for those ideas will probably go down like a bit of a lead balloon in Parliament. OK, Olivia, thank you very much indeed, as I said. And just to reiterate, more from Liz Truss with Nigel Farage again tonight on his show, 7pm here on GB News. We want to know what you think about yes. what Liz Truss is having to say, whether you agree, disagree, and how you see her future. 40, how many days? 40? 44 days after she became Prime Minister, she resigned, 49 days in office. Do you hold her responsible for the collapse of the economy? Can you forgive her for the impact that had on mortgages? Would you welcome a comeback? Perhaps you would like to see her uh, lined up uh, as leader of the Conservatives after the next election. Who knows what might happen? I was listening happen. to a radio phone-in and uh, a few people from her constituency, which I think was in Suffolk... Or North, or South, North? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, something like that. Wherever it is. Mm. And uh, anyway, apparently they don't see a lot of her. They don't think that she represented the constituency very well, but she's been there for quite a long time, mm, ten it's years a safe or so. Seat, I think. Uh, let us know your views again on that. The time, eight minutes past six. World leaders have called for restraint as Israel has vowed revenge against Iran following the weekend's attacks. Uh, their military chief has said the country is still considering its steps but confirmed the attack will be met with a response. Speaking on Patrick Christie's programme last night, former Armed Forces Minister James Heapy warned Israel to show restraint. What could have been a sort of Pearl Harbour type moment was 99% repelled and they and, the, and as a consequence gives Israel the opportunity to not respond and, and escalate. Now Israel may still choose to do so. I think the UK should be absolutely clear in our resolve to continue to be willing to defend Israel from these mm. attacks. Always our priority must be to try and... So you support them in defensive action, less so in offensive action? Yeah, look, I think think, your question was, should we be making a commitment to go with the Israelis? I mean, I I don't think we should. Well, let's get the thoughts of the US political analyst, Eric Hamm. Good morning to you, Eric. Um, Thank you for joining us. Um, Lots of tension here uh, in London, probably a very late night for the Foreign Office, wondering uh, what Israel's next moves are going to be. Do you think that Israel takes any notice of what President Biden says anymore? I do not. And I think what we just heard from that guest there, I think that's the thinking of a lot of people within the Biden administration, as well as many Americans. Uh, I think people are willing to stand with Israel if Israel is, in fact, attacked. But I think what we're seeing now is Israel and President Biden has made clear this was a win for Israel, given that this attack by Iran did very little inside of Israel. And now that the United States has made clear, if Israel decides to go on the offensive, the United States will not will not be a part of that. Nevertheless, what we're seeing in the United States is Congress is feverishly moving to try to move aid both to Ukraine and Israel as a result of this attack. And still, the Biden administration is continuing to try to put pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu not only to de-escalate tensions, but also to not move forward with a military offensive in Rafa. All of those attempts at pressuring, cajoling, seem to be falling on deaf ears right now. Um, What about the row um, that's being had over here uh, about whether or not the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, should be prescribed a terrorist organisation? It's dividing opinion here. I don't know if the same row is being had over the pond. Um, But in this country, at least, the the Foreign Secretary, the Prime Minister, is saying, look, we're one of the few countries that has an embassy in Iran. I don't think the States has one. It's an important back channel, and that would uh, break down if we did prescribe them as terrorists. Is that a view that you share? 
No, I don't think that's something that we would see from the administration in Washington or even from uh, many uh, lawmakers in Washington uh, that this should actually take place. But I do think what what is happening is uh, the United States has had an enormous amount of back channel uh, engagement with Iran. And so I think the United States will use every opportunity to do that. And I think if there is this designation, that would make it very difficult and could potentially cut off one of those key back channels that the United States sees as so vital. Uh, Eric, you believe there could be a silver lining in all of this so that would affect um, uh, Ukraine and um, uh, as well as what's going on in the Middle East? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we know that uh, the $60 billion aid package for Ukraine has been held up for quite some time now. And after this attack, we now see Speaker Mike Johnson is, a, is now saying that he will bring both of these aid packages, uh, aid for Israel and aid for Ukraine, to the floor this week. Now, we know the Biden administration, as well as President Zelensky, has been pushing for these aid packages, and now it looks like it might happen. Now, of course, the Biden administration, we've heard from Admiral, Admiral Kirby saying that they do not want separate standalone packages. But it looks like that might be what happens here. And it's all very complex, given what we're seeing play out, because while there is ongoing tensions that are very real in the United States, I'm sorry, in the Middle East, there are still very thorny domestic political issues that the Biden administration is attempting to navigate here in Washington. OK, Eric, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Eric Ham is an American political analyst speaking to us live there from Washington at the time, 30 minutes past six. Uh, in 45 minutes time, a 48-hour strike will begin by consultants and specialist doctors in Wales. This is, is a dispute over pay. Christmas Day covers to be provided during the walkout by the BMA Cymru Wales. The unions rejected a sub-inflationary pay offer from the Welsh government of 5%. A judge has ordered Prince Harry to pay 90% of Home Office legal costs after losing a case over the Home Office, cutting his personal security. The Duke of Sussex had argued the court should reduce the amount he was required to pay by more than half. MPs today will debate some of the strictest tobacco laws as the Prime Minister plans to ban Generation Alpha, that's those born after 2009, from smoking. Rishi Sunak's facing the prospect of another Tory rebellion, though, uh, and he may need to rely on Labour votes to secure the passage of one of his key policies. Hannah Guterres read the armourer for the film Rust, which saw cinematographer Helena Hutchins shot and killed by a loaded gun given to the actor Alec Baldwin, has been sentenced to 18 months in prison. The set weapons handler was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter in a New Mexico court. Baldwin will also face a manslaughter trial in July. National Trust has come under fire from locals in the village of Sudbury, that's in Derbyshire, after they were told sports fields, community sports fields, were being taken back for the Trust to meet eco targets. Yeah, that it will be evicting the football club that uses it. Our reporter Jack Carson has the story. In the quaint Derbyshire village of Sudbury, there's a storm brewing between the local football club and the National Trust. This grass field might seem unremarkable, but for hundreds of years it's been part of the Sudbury Hall estate, playing host to the village football and cricket matches. Now the National Trust are planning to put an end to that tradition in the name of biodiversity, with plans for trees and plants where the football club play. Some worry it breaks a memorandum of wishes from the late Lord Vernon, whose family have lived here since 1660. Manager of Sudbury FC Tom Crutchley says he's upset at the decision. Naturally disappointed. Um, a lot. We've been here, this is our ninth year. Um, you know, we've put a lot of effort into, into here to, to keep playing, to maintain it. Um, I'm from the village originally, so personally it was, yeah, very... Yeah, it is very upsetting, not just for our team, but for future generations. But the amount of land they have here, it's over 20 acres, I believe, there's surely enough room for that and for the amount of times that we play. Because we, we play between 10 to 15 home games a year, under 2% of the time that we're here. So we're not really in the way as much. The National Trust want to support local communities um, and build strong relations. Um, and by doing this, not letting us play here, it probably doesn't help that. 
The proposed changes have upset local people who worry businesses in the area might also feel the impact of losing it as a community space. MP for Derbyshire Dale Sarah Dines says the National Trust aren't respecting the history of the site. I feel they're trampling over the wishes of historic owners who gave up this wonderful site for the nation. And for over 100 years, people have played football and cricket here. It's incredibly sad incredibly sad and it's against the wishes of a lot of people locally who've written to me from the village and uh, the I know it's a tricky issue maintaining this sort of ground but the government's given a lot of money for grassroots sport and there would be funds available to keep it as it is. It's not just plans for the sports field that have upset the Member of Parliament. Sudbury Hall lives under the branding of the children's country house, a decision which Dine says is disrespectful to the history of the estate. I mean this is fake to make it into a children's theme park. It's almost a reimagining and in fact that's the very words it says on their website. The house has reopened, it's been reimagined. I don't want our heritage to be reimagined. I think I think the National Trust has been it's been captured by people who have different ideas than most people in this country. In response to the concerns raised about the plans for the sports field, a National Trust spokesperson said, although the National Trust will not be able to continue running the land as a space for hire on a commercial basis, the local community will continue to be able to enjoy it free of charge for family leisure time, games and activities such as picnicking, dog walking and village celebrations. We are also looking at plans to restore the land back to a Grade 2 listed landscape, which will include grassland and the planting of new trees that will blend the area with the surrounding historic parkland. Whilst the public will still be able to roam these historic grounds, the village feels like a legacy is being snatched away. Jack Carson, GB News, Sudbury. Well, the thing is, the public can roam those legendary grounds uh, the way it exists. Um, there doesn't seem to be any need at all to throw out a football team and stop them using that pitch. Um, Liz Truss, last night, of course, she was complaining a lot about um, how the country is being held ransom to uh, echo, what are they called, echo diversity uh, projects and whatever, and how she believes it's bankrupting the comp country, um, that our, our devotion to getting things uh, reformed or right mm -hmm. from uh, an eco... What is it? Not, not eco... Eco-friendly eco, eco mm -hmm. way, whatever it is. Anyway, I, I hate being treated like a moron. There's a green pitch, there are bumblebees on that and, and flies and all sorts of things going on there. We can walk across, we can walk our dogs, we can do this. Mm -hmm. Then you get the National Trust coming along and they destroy, and what they are doing in Sudbury is destroying community life. That's my view. Uh, gbnews.com forward slash your say. Have your say this morning and uh, we will um, we're talking about National Trust land seizure. Why? Mm. Up next, forget sleepy Biden. It was a sleepy Donald as he appeared in court yesterday and became the first US president to face a criminal trial. Now according to reporters in the room Donald Trump appeared to doze off. Now I have to say, looking at his pictures yesterday I do think the man and some of them are on the front page of the papers today he looked really fatigued. He did look tired. He looked stressed. Um, he's, uh, you know, so anyway, is it any surprise that he may have nodded off? <laughs> well, the former president has been charged with falsifying business records ahead of the 2016 election to cover up a £130,000 payment to the porn star Stormy Daniels. Yeah, he is denying the allegation. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. Well, joining us now is 2020 Republican presidential candidate and former Congressman Joe Walsh. Very good morning to you. Um, it's going to be a bit of a frustrating week for all of us who want to see this trial get underway. A lot of procedure, a lot of issues of trying to find jurors that uh, won't sort of rule themselves out as, as having an opinion on Donald Trump. Perhaps all that procedure was just too boring for the Donald yesterday. Yeah, how about that, right? All this talk about Joe Biden being so damn old and Joe Biden can't stay awake. We forget that Trump's an old guy, too, and it sounds like he might have fallen asleep in court. Look, Donald Trump did all he could do to stop this trial from happening. It's happening. And so now he's going to do all he can do, he and his team, to delay 
and delay and delay the trial from really ever taking place. So this could go on for a while. You're not a fan, Joe. Um, why? I think he's a direct threat to our democracy. We forget this guy keeps making history. Uh, he's in that courtroom, as you said, the first American president to ever be on trial criminally. Uh, he was the first American president who lost an election, refused to participate in the peaceful transfer of power, and then he tried to overthrow that election. So, yeah, I consider that pretty damn dangerous. And yet, he's hugely popular, and it is a democracy, and popularity is what he needs to get back into the White House. How much damage do you think these criminal trials, as you say, this is a first now, because he's had so many civil cases, and we're used to seeing him in court, and we're used to mugshots, all the rest of it, but this is the first of, I think, four criminal trials, long drawn out, cross-examination, lots of witnesses. Do you think this could be the final straw for Donald Trump, or do you think it will simply serve to strengthen his base? No, th yeah, this won't be the final straw at all. And, and by the way, this is probably the only trial we'll see before the election. Look, if the election were held tomorrow, Donald Trump would beat Joe Biden. I, I want everybody to know that. Trump's popular. I think he's beating Biden right now. And this trial, again, Donald Trump's whole thing is I'm the victim, I'm the victim, I'm the victim. This plays right into it, and he's going to continue to play that up. You know, Joe, if he did fall asleep um, yesterday, I'm just looking at him and so, some of the pictures that, that we saw, he did look fatigued yesterday. Um, normally, he doesn't seem to be too down by the amount of court cases and court appearances that he, that he seems to make, but this one could be different because he, he could end up in jail um, after this one. He could, but I don't think that most legal experts don't think that's going to happen. Uh, he could end up being convicted uh, on this. And, and, and we'll know. I mean, obviously, unless he can stop this trial, we'll have this verdict before the election. And, and he may be convicted for falsifying business records. But I don't think that hurts him politically and not just with his base. And by the way, Joe Biden's old and he's got a lot of issues, too. This election's going to be really close. It's crazy, but this is where America is. It, it astounds me that you say that the, this, this other criminal trial that he's facing in relation um, to election racketeering might happen after another election. How can somebody stand for election when accused of election racketeering and potentially win the presidency and then later be convicted of it? Where does that leave America? What message is that sending to the world? Um, and, and, you know, and what does it mean you know, for, for the Republican Party? Because you're a former Republican or you still are a Republican. I mean, there are lots of... We speak to them on this programme. We had Amy Tarkarian yesterday. Lots of disenfranchised Republicans. And yet this base that are so, so keen on him. Remember when Trump said, what, six, seven years ago, eight years ago, I could shoot somebody in the middle of Manhattan and I'd still be popular and fine, I could get yeah. elected? That's where the, my former party is. Look, the Republican Party is a cult. He is the cult leader. He can do no wrong. I know a lot of people don't understand that. I've never seen that before in our history, but that's where we are. The world should be frightened. America's pretty effed up right now. Our politics is broken. I mean, look at this. Donald Trump tried to overthrow an election, and he's, he's the nominee for president three and a half years later. If that doesn't tell you there's something wrong with our politics here in America, man, I don't know what will. Well, it may depend on who falls asleep first. Um, <laughs> thank you. Joe, thanks very much indeed. That was Joe Walsh there. Really appreciate thanks. it, Joe. Um, he, Joe himself was a presidential candidate, a uh, former congressman um, as well. Yeah, lots of views coming in on this. Um, Trump may be flawed, but if I was an American, I'd vote for him. It's better than the commies that are running what is becoming a fascist state. Um, other people saying um, Trump, Trump is so popular, he'll win the presidency. Um, and this one's interesting, John Andrews. If Donald Trump was in power, October the 7th wouldn't have happened. Ukraine wouldn't have happened. The rockets being fired at cargo ships wouldn't have happened. I still believe COVID was put there to get rid of him by the Chinese because of all the tariffs he made them start paying. So there we go. Uh, lots of people 
Um, keen to see him return. Mm. And he probably will. OK. <laughs> It's funny talking to Joe Walsh there. The biggest travel agent in Ireland was called Joe oh, Walsh. Oh, really? Joe Walsh Tours. So maybe he's got Irish heritage. Maybe he has. Walsh. That, was, that was in the 1970s, 80s. I uh, don't think Joe Walsh exists anymore. Um, but... Oh, my goodness me, the weather yesterday, Eamon. I mean, we'd been talking all morning about oh. how gorgeous the weekend had been and we hadn't seen daylight and we stepped out of here yeah. after the programme and it was like a hurricane. Mm. Um, will it persist? Alex Deacon has your forecast. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Another fresh start out there this morning. Many of us seeing sunny spells. There will be a few showers, but it's not as many, not as heavy as the ones we saw yesterday. Still, it's a bit of a wet start over parts of Lincolnshire down through East Anglia. A fair few showers scattered across Wales as well. We'll see more coming into northern Scotland through the day. Still a fairly brisk breeze, but not as blustery, not as gusty as yesterday. We should see some decent spells of sunshine over parts of North Wales. Uh, northern England and southwest Scotland. Temperatures still struggling a little bit, feeling fresh in that breeze, but generally with a bit more sunshine, the wind's a little lighter than yesterday. It does feel a little warmer, or it certainly will do by this afternoon. Going to turn quite chilly overnight, though. More showers packing in across northern Scotland with a, a gusty wind blowing here. We'll see a fair few showers drifting across northern England and Wales through the night. They'll crop up across parts of the south during the early hours. It will be a chilly old night, though. Four or five in towns and cities, lower across parts of northern England, southern Scotland. A hint of blue on the chart. Some rural spots could easily start below freezing uh, tomorrow morning. So, again, a chilly start. For many, quite a sunny start tomorrow. Main exception to that will be northern. Northern Ireland, cloud moving in here, uh, a dull, damp day, and some of that rain will spread to southwest Scotland, North Wales later on. Sprinkling of showers over parts of the east, but again, many places dodging the showers dry and bright, but again, for most, on the cool side. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Forget about the weather and just think of good weather, oh, nice yeah. cruises, sunshine, all the rest. Here is our great British giveaway. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Right, still to come, we've got Paul Coit uh, with the sport. Uh, stay tuned for that. Plenty of goals to talk about last night. Uh, this is Breakfast on GB News. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 
Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Uh, got the sport polls with us uh, right now, talking about Chelsea putting six past Everton. Chelsea, six. Everton, nil. This Cole Palmer kid, I've got to tell you, he should be going to the Euros. Yeah, he knows the... where the back of the net is, doesn't God, he? doesn't he? Perfect hat-trick. One with the left, one with the, one with the right, one with his head. And uh, the 20th league goal that he's got, he's a midfielder and he is top of the Golden Boot rankings, along with Erling Haaland. Mm, mm. He's, he's incredible. But that's what you want, a midfielder that scores. I know. Anybody that scores, he should, yes. he'd be good as far as... Well, yeah. but, but the um, interesting thing, there was, there was a, a bit of argy-bargy when the penalty was taken. So they got a penalty, and it was... It's always going to be Cole Palmer that takes the penalty because yeah. he's the, obviously the penalty taker. So, anyway, it was um, Noni Madweke picks up the ball because he was the one that was kicked over in, in, the, in the box. He thought to get the penalty, although it actually happened to Palmer. He picks up the ball, wants to take it, and it's like, well, no, it's Palmer's penalty. He takes the penalty. He's gone over to take it, and it's all this. Oh. You know, a bit chuckle brothers, you know, me to you to... <laughs> anyway, then... And there's four of them that are really involved in an argument. Who's going to take the penalty? Cole Palmer then takes it... Puts it on the spot, scores, uh, but then Maurizio Pochettino saying afterwards, not good enough, not happy with that. If there's any arguments like that, none of them will play. But it was, it was pretty ridiculous. But a great result, 6-0, can't argue against that. Everton, um, really not great. And also they're going to be appealing, or they have appealed about this, this latest two-point penalty, yeah. which then could affect them at the end of the season if things, you know, stay wobbly. Um, but the Premier League has promised that it will be resolved by the last game of the season, so we yeah. will know. Because it uh, may affect them, may put them down. Meanwhile, there's a... Bit of speculation in the back of the papers. Uh, Alexandro Garnacho at Manchester United he was substituted against Brentford at half time. Social media. Uh, yeah. On Saturday. Yeah. Uh, what's the story there? Well, he was substituted. He's a good player, but he was taken off at half time. And it's a big statement, though, to bring a player off at half time. It always is, isn't it? Mm. And it always sounds like it's a manager going, I'm in charge. And we know what's happened with Ten Hag before with Jaden Sancho. So, anyway. Um, social media, he saw a post on social media, Garnacho liked it, basically criticising Eric Ten Hag, um, saying about he was being thrown under the bus, so he's liked the tweets, and it's been seen that he's liked it, mm. so now he's been hauled over the coals. That old chestnut. Exactly, that old one. Got to be careful what you do. Does a like do. necessarily mean a like? Does a like not mean recognised or logged as well? Oh, yeah, just amused or... Interesting. Yeah. yeah, interesting. See, I've been, I've been done with that, though. I've yeah. liked something when you said... Then hmm. someone... What, what was that? Yeah, well, Did like, he know I'd done it? No, but if someone put something bad up, for example, like, terrible to break the news, blah, 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 you might like it in a show of support yeah. for yes. them, but not for the fact that person's died or whatever. So it doesn't necessarily... So let's, so, so let's look at the evidence. OK. Yes. Let's look at the evidence. Oh, OK. So the tweet has gone up and it's saying, Eric Ten Hag, disgraced that Canacho was taken off. He's been thrown under the bus as far as the rest of the team's concerned. He's liked it. Is there any mitigating circumstances that says Garnacho was OK in this situation? Interesting theory. I That's feel like all. Perry Mason. That's who yeah. I feel like, honestly. <laughs> uh, Champions League uh, back over the next couple of nights. Yeah, a little bit of Champions League. Yeah, that's back tonight. So we're getting to knockout. And this is when you start enjoying it. Barcelona against PSG, so they're 3-2 up. Borussia Dortmund against Atletico Madrid. Oh, by the way, it's a new world record. I, you know, I love a world record, uh -huh. especially with the Olympics coming up. The discus world record... Yes. And I, did you ever do discus? Yes. We had a wooden discus. Do you have a wooden discus with like a metal thing around the outside? Exactly. That's exactly what it was, yeah. 
It used to fly yeah, out the was... back of the hand instead of the... Yeah. But this record has stood for 38 years. Okay. So it was a German that held it. And when you look back in the 80s and you're thinking, a lot of those, you know, let's not be honest. Stop it. Let's be, well, you know what I'm saying. OK, so anyway, the new world record has gone and uh, if I could tell you, it's, it's stood for 38 years and it's Miklos Alekna from Lithuania, 74.35 metres and how about this, his dad is the third furthest thrower when it comes to the distance wow. as well. So it's all in the family, Runs so yeah, so he's broken, he's broken the new world record. Uh, the Beijing half marathon, bit of controversy. Oh, yeah. Have a quick look at this. Have a quick look at this. Beijing Half Marathon. Organise invest organisers investigated how it ended. Three African runners there. Now, look. They're running along. Now, they look like they could be walking here. Yeah. The Beijing Half Marathon. Surprise, surprise. It's a Chinese runner that then takes the lead. He Jai from China. Then, look, they all look like they're jogging along. So those three, you would say, they're going to win this easily. Yes. But then he overtakes them. They don't seem to be... They don't look as if they're race. trying. They don't look as if they're trying, so they're going to have a look at organisers now investigating how it ended. Well, I think oh. we can see how it ended. Mm. And then oh. he ends up winning the gold medal. Mm. Mm. Do we smell a rat? Oh, I'm not dear. Really sure. I wouldn't dare say so. You never know what happens. Yeah. Uh, Paul, see you again, 45 minutes' time. Good. I've got so much Cheers. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, stay with us. Coming up, we'll be speaking to the Government Minister for Victims and Safeguarding, that's Laura Farris, about the government's crackdown on deep fakes. Plus, Nikki Hodson and Mark Ryan Parsons are here to take a look at the front pages and the big stories making the news. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in Gwyneth. The A4871 is blocked southbound towards Bangor Street in Carnarvon because of a fallen tree. On the M6 in Warwickshire, the southbound exit slip roads closed at Junction 3, the Coventry and Nuneaton turn for emergency barrier repairs. Train services are suspended between Broxbourne and Stansted Mount Fitchett and also between Stansted Airport and both Cambridge and Birmingham New Street after a tree fell, causing overhead line problems. Now in London, the A223 is closed along Perry Hall Road in Orpington there's an overturned vehicle just off the high street. The M25 from Kent into Surrey is closed clockwise from Junction 5 for the M26 to 6 at Godston after an accident. They're accused towards the closure of phase 2 down the A21 and A25. And also in Kent, the A249 is closed southbound on Detling Hill for repairs. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Well, we're joined now uh, by the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State and Minister for Victims and Safeguarding, Laura Farris. Welcome to the programme. Good morning to you. Um, I want to start by talking to you about our top story this morning. This is an interview that Liz Truss has given uh, to Nigel Farage here on the channel. She's made a number uh, of claims about how she would like to save uh, the West over the next 10 years. But she laments, really, the blob, I suppose, is what a lot of politicians call it, uh, the deep state that she says uh, uh, dramatically and devastatingly brought down her premiership. She says that politicians have almost no power anymore, including uh, organisations like the Supreme Court being undemocratic. Do you agree? I've got to say I don't agree, actually. Um, I think that um, I think we have a healthy democracy, a pluralistic democracy, and I think that institutions like the Supreme Court um, are vital, actually, and it's always been the case that we've had a judiciary, which our judiciary has admired the world over. 
Okay, well, I mean, she also takes aim at the ECHR. That's something that the Prime Minister does agree with her on. He's also saying that uh, they've got overreach on a number of issues that they've been talking about recently. But Suella Bravman has joined Liz Truss in undermining the Prime Minister today, saying he actually lacks the political will to pull out. It's all rhetoric. Is she on to something there? Well, look, I'm, I'm not going to comment too much on what other politicians are saying. I, I can't answer for them. And... You'd need to get them senior on your members of your own thinking, party. I, I, okay, I mean that that might be right, but I just say this: I can, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think some mm -hmm. of the focus on the European Court of Human Rights has been in relation to the Rwanda scheme. I think you, you will know that we're getting the legislation through the House, and we hope to have it on the statute books by the end of this week. But really, um, you know. The issues with, with that uh, come really substantially from things like the Refugee Convention rather than the European Convention on Human Rights. The Prime Minister said that he's confident that that legislation complies with all our international obligations, but in extremis, if it doesn't, he will not allow a foreign court to block planes from taking off, and I think he's been crystal clear on that. Laura, um, there's going to be um, an announcement, a governmental announcement, about deep fake porn and sexual images um, today. Uh, what are you proposing to do about those, and why does this worry you so much? Well, one, what we're doing, and to the best of my knowledge, I think we are one of the first governments in the world to do this, is we're creating a criminal offence of anyone who creates a sexually explicit deep fake image, even if they do so privately um, for their own either you know, sexual gratification, it will become a criminal offence. And we've been listening really carefully to campaigners and also to people who work in tech. And we know that AI is probably the most rapidly evolving potential harm actually in this area and we know that it overwhelmingly affects women women and very young women girls and so we have taken the decision to create a crime of making a deep fake image for sexual gratification without a person's consent interesting um apparently a number of high profile people have already fallen victim to these deep fake porn ai uh, make sort of mashups, if you like, Taylor Swift among them, and the prominent um, American yeah. politician, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, and she talked about the, the personal trauma of seeing herself in these horrendous situations that have been imagined by AI in the car with her children as she learned of this news. So politicians like yourself and celebrities also falling victim to this. Well, you're right, actually, and it is something that I know a number of politicians in Westminster from all parties have um, been made aware that they've been victims of this. But I just want to say one thing. We're not just doing it because it's affected celebrities. We know that it affects normal people, too. And one of the analogies, actually, that we've been drawing is that it is, it is an offence in this country to create an explosive device, even if you're doing so privately in your kitchen, uh, but we do it because if it falls into the wrong hands or if motive changes, it could cause catastrophic harm. And in a psychological sense, creating a grossly offensive, explicit video where you're using a real person's you know, face and you're superimposing that and you're making it look incredibly realistic can cause actually catastrophic psychological harm. And we have heard you know, from what well, we know about well-known women, but we also know there are lots of ordinary women who have become victims of this. And we're, we're trying to nip this in the bud, deal with it before it becomes uh, a more serious problem. And we had this legislative opportunity and we wanted to be on the front foot with this and actually future-proof our laws. And uh, what would the penalty for breaching that law be? So... The penalty for just creating is an unlimited fine and a criminal record. If you go on to share, you can get up to two years in prison and you end up on the sex offenders register. And Eamon, I just want to say one thing on that. You might think that's quite low, but one of the things that we had to deal with was, in fact, a very helpful piece of work by the Law Commission who actually advised against creating, uh, making a sort of creating this stuff an offence because they said, look, you could capture teenage boys, you could over-criminalise sort of idiotic older children who are doing this kind of thing. And we had to think really carefully about that and about striking the right balance. Mm. But ultimately, we decided that it was a crime. We thought it did cross a threshold. We thought it was inherently misogynistic gateway conduct. So, yes, if a 
teenage boy does this, they, they are committing a criminal offence, but no, they won't up in, end up in prison. And if they just create, they won't go onto the sex offenders register. But as I say, it escalates from there. OK, um, just before we let you go, um, I just want to ask you about the Iran-Israel situation. Um, a moment ago, I was hinting about the divisions within your party with the undermining comments from Liz Truss and Suella Bravman, but there are also divisions on how to deal with this particular issue, aren't there? I mean, Labour has been calling for the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps to be prescribed as a terrorist organisation for over a year, but now members of your own party, Ian Duncan-Smith and indeed Suella Bravman, also calling for that, but they're at odds with the Prime Minister and uh, with the Foreign Secretary. Why shouldn't we? And would we be in a better position if we did? Well, look, nobody is suggesting that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard is uh, anything other than a, 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 a problematic and difficult organisation. We already sanction them. We already have, have restrict, may place very serious restrictions on them. The issue of prescribing them is one that David Cameron addressed yesterday and he said, look, one of the things that we still value is the fact that we have a direct route to Tehran. We have an embassy there. We have diplomatic channels. We can pick up the phone and have conversations, even with governments. Yes, that we have very significant challenges with. Those conversations are difficult. But actually, there is a value to having a direct line of communication. So that was the reason he gave, and I think it's compelling in the circumstances. Just because we have hostile relations with a country doesn't mean we necessarily want to cut everything off. And, um, you know, one of the things the Prime Minister actually has said is that we're, we keep this under constant review. So it's not a final decision. It's something that's always being carefully considered. Okay. Minister, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, Laura Farris. Um, we've Thank got you. Ryan Mark Parsons and we've got Nikki Hodgson. Uh, going through um, stories that will make the news today. And this uh, deep fake story will be making the news later on today. Nikki, what do you think? I think it's impossible to implement. I really, really worry about how naive the government has been at the minute. Mm. Because, you know, a few weeks ago we had the announcement about the cyber flashing uh, new law, which was on the same basis, we will find the person and we will prosecute them. You cannot find people on the internet that create images um, under pseudonyms, on computers that use the blockchain, that are encrypted, you know. I, d I've got, I just think they're so naive. I don't know how. If somebody sends you an image and it's from an anonymous account, are the police then going to try and find out mm. who owns that anonymous account? Mm. It will be absolutely impossible. And what I worry about, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. It was a long time ago. Ten years ago, the government should have cared about this. But they're always so behind the curve in terms of where tech but is. But she was saying we're ahead of the rest of the well, world. Well, it's not, it's not good enough because, mm. you know, porn created this 10, 15 years ago, you know, yeah. for, its, for its own pleasure. Do you so. know what I think is not good enough? Saying that, oh, well, it might have been created by a 14-year-old. That's whatever. not good enough either. I agree. You can't go, I'm sorry, but, you know, there is so, so much sexual violence Yep. committed yep. by teenage boys, right? And they have to and learn at some stage. Absolutely. This business of protecting them, they've got to be told when they're 8 or 9 or 10 or absolutely. 11 or whatever it happens to be. I mean, it's like saying, well, he shot her, but he was only 7, so, we I mean, he couldn't yeah. really mean to it's murder not, her. It's not good enough. That age, that age group is so, so sensitive, they can do so much harm to women and girls, and, I mean, think just letting them off is not the point. Mm. And that seems the wrong message to me mm. as well. OK. Right, other stories making the news uh, this morning. Ryan, um, where should we go? Do you fancy talking about smoking? I don't suppose you fit into that age bracket. No, you're not Generation Alpha. No, not quite. Alpha. I'm, I'm not Generation Alpha, which is born after 2009. I'm Generation Z, or okay. Z. Um, <laughs> I was born in 2000, but yes. The government's looking to ban those of Generation Alpha from buying cigarettes and vapes. And I, I think that's a great move. I think there's not enough research gone into vapes. I mean, at the moment, they're saying there's about 2,000 dangerous toxins in vapes. It can cause uh, illnesses like... Um, bronchitis and popcorn lungs and there's so much more research that needs to go into finding uh, the harmful results of uh, smoking uh, vapes and even with cigarettes I mean we know the diseases that can cause 7,000 toxins can be found in cigarettes I think it's a great thing that this bill comes into legislation hopefully but at the moment uh, the government are finding resistance in uh, around 100 Tory MPs that are going to rebel against this uh, well, it depends bill. who you listen to the, the Telegraph have 50 MPs quoted but either way it looks as though they may mm. have to rely on Labour to get this bill through which is never a good look for, for the government. No but they do have cross-party support so hopefully with that support from Labour they will see this piece of legislation come into uh, place. Nikki here's a situation uh, re-car thefts uh, police are no show in 
70% of car thefts, according to the Mirror. Yeah, I believe it. We had our car nicked, nobody came, nobody cared. Our car was mm. literally taken from outside our house by a truck that was pulled up in the night. They just lifted the car onto it and drove away with it. When we talked to the police, they said, oh, it's too late. It's, it's an East, uh, Eastern European gang that have already taken it all apart and sold the mm. parts in Europe. Yeah. Mm. We had a Jaguar, it's what happens, right? Yeah. And they have no interest, absolutely zero mm. interest yeah. in solving it as a crime. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, what are you supposed to do? Lots of people in lots of cities don't have garages, right? I mean, garage space is very limited. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's lots, lots of people have to street park. It really puts you off having a car. And also just, it's the whole trust in the police thing again. Mm -hmm. If that's a crime, then that if they're not going to deal with it anymore, then take it off the statute books. I mean, it's just mm. it's just ridiculous if you can't report the it. The same thing happened to my parents. Their car was taken off their drive and they had CCTV footage and the police still wouldn't come. Yeah. Um, and I actually put in a call to the police. They eventually took the CCTV, but even with that, they said, there's nothing we can do. They took the registration plates off the car when they drove around the corner. It's probably halfway to India now. Absolutely. They, they've just given yeah. up on trying to solve mm. it as a crime. And that's very Well, also, the, the, they're, they're too busy solving these rubbish... <laughs> Um, new crimes that are being... Uh, hate crimes. Hate Scotland, Scotland, whatever they are. Uh, and uh, whatever, whatever. Um, though I have to say, twice uh, this year, uh, driving into work in the morning, um, I have been stopped by police <laughs> wanting to know if uh, I'd stolen my car. Or, or not. <laughs> well, that's so interesting. They can be bothered to do that. Yeah. Well, yeah, they yeah. can be bothered to do that, but they can't be bothered to follow up the cars that definitely have been stolen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ryan, a third of people caught with hard drugs are let off by the police. Hmm. Well, I think there's a lack of government direction. So the police are now really taking matters into their own hands. And I was reading as well, 39% of people caught with these hard drugs are avoiding a criminal record and they're given community resolutions instead. So... I think there needs to be harder uh, guidance given, well, stronger guidance given by the government to police in order to give uh, a bit more direction in terms of how to enforce uh, this particular crime. I mean, look, for example, 23,000 cases where the police had evidence to actually charge uh, people called in possession of Class A drugs. Only seven, I mean, 7,000 of those cases were given community resolutions. So people that actually, the police have evidence to charge these perpetrators, yet they're being led off. And I think there is some kind of de facto uh, decriminalization of these drugs, but the police are just allow, allowed to handle it and they take the matters there, in their own hands. There is always the argument, isn't there, that the issue of drugs and drug use isn't, shouldn't be a criminal matter. It's often a health issue. A lot of these addicts of people with yeah. complex issues issues and actually yeah. criminalising it makes it worse. Yeah, I mean, lots of parents, you know, lots of mothers take drugs. Um, and, you know, what do you do if you if you put them in jail, which you can do with Class A drugs, then you, you know, wreck a family. And that's kind of part of the reason we don't have any room in jails for people that are, uh, are taking drugs uh, for their own use. Um, the supplying issue is, is another matter altogether. I think what's worrying is that actually lots of people that do take drugs rec recreationally, I've got no idea how severe the penalties actually are if they're caught. And, of course, when the police do this, it it's, it's quite easy to think, oh, if I get caught, I'll get let off. But it's really a matter for that particular police force mm. to decide. You know, you might just mm. it, you might just get caught with the wrong police officer. Mm. Uh, what phone to buy? Who decides on that? Uh, this is uh, Apple has, has lost its crown as the biggest uh, phone maker. Samsung now uh, taking that over. Ryan, mm. um, my own story on this is that um, I, I've always had Android phones, Samsung phones, and uh, then twice they've done this to me. They then ask you for a password to access your information again that you have not created. Oh, right. Therefore, they will tell you what the password is, you can't access it, and you lose all the information you had on your phone. So I then made an even bigger mistake and said, right, I've had enough of this, I'm buying an iPhone. What a <laughs> lot of rubbish. <laughs> I've never had a worse experience than, than the Apple phone. Really? Awful. I mean, I've had one Samsung phone and I thought it was horrendous. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think Apple is great, but yes, they have lost, uh, they've lost the lead at the moment. Samsung have taken over uh, in the global market uh, share. And I can't see why, because my experience with Samsung devices, Android devices are absolutely rubbish well, compared maybe, to iPhones. Um, they're just overpriced. There's an issue with Apple, and they're always being sort of built in um, obsolescence. It's, it's what you're used there. to. What, yeah. what you're used what to, you're really. Used to. You get used to the operator. You get used right. to it. We'll be used to you two again <laughs> in about 40 minutes' time. We'll see you again. Here's Thank Alex Deacon. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Good morning. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Another fresh start out there this morning. Many of us seeing sunny spells. There will be a few showers, but it's not as many, not as heavy as the ones we saw yesterday. Still, it's a bit of a wet start over parts of Lincolnshire, down through East Anglia. A fair few showers scattered across Wales as well. We'll see more coming into northern Scotland through the day. Still a fairly brisk breeze, but not as blustery, not as gusty as yesterday. We should see some decent spells of sunshine over parts of North Wales. Uh, northern England and southwest Scotland. Temperatures still struggling a little bit, feeling fresh in that breeze, but generally with a bit more sunshine, the wind's a little lighter than yesterday. It does feel a little warmer, or it certainly will do by this afternoon. Going to turn quite chilly overnight, though. More showers packing in across northern Scotland with a, a gusty wind blowing here. We'll see a fair few showers drifting across northern England and Wales through the night. They'll crop up across parts of the south during the early hours. It will be a chilly old night, though. Four or five in towns and cities, lower across parts of northern England, southern Scotland. A hint of blue on the chart. Some rural spots could easily start below freezing uh, tomorrow morning. So again, a chilly start, for many quite a sunny start tomorrow. Main exception to that will be Northern Ireland. Cloud moving in here, uh, a dull, damp day, and some of that rain will spread to southwest Scotland, North Wales later on. Sprinkling of showers over parts of the east, but again, many places dodging the showers dry and bright, but again, for most, on the cool side. That warm feeling inside, from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in Gwyneth. The A4871 is blocked southbound towards Bangor Street in Carnarvon because of a fallen tree. On the M6 in Warwickshire, the southbound exit at Junction 3, the Coventry and Uneaton turn, is closed for emergency barrier repairs. Train services are suspended between Broxbourne and Stansted Mount Fitchett and between Stansted Airports and Cambridge after a fallen tree brought down overhead lines. In London, the A223 is closed along Perry Hall Road in Orpington because of an overturned vehicle. The M25 from Kent into Surrey is closed clockwise from Junction 5 at the M26 to 6 at Godston after an accident. There are queues from Junction 4 at Orpington with delays to as it divert down the A21 and onto the A25. And the M26 in Kent is also closed westbound from Junction 2 at Rootham to the M25 causing queues. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good morning, fast approaching 7 o'clock. Uh, thank you for your company on this Tuesday, the 16th of April. Uh, you're tuned in to Breakfast here in GB News. Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster. Our top story this morning, Liz Truss is back with a new book, Ten Years to Save the West, as she tells all about her time in government. Officials were constantly looking to Brussels for validation. And it, all of that needed to change. Liz Truss not pulling her punches in that interview last night. But what will her words mean for Rishi Sunak? Find out more with me very soon. Suella so Braverman slimes the Prime Minister for lacking the political will to ditch the ECHR as the Rwanda bill heads back to the House of Lords. The West calls for restraint as Israel vows to respond over Iran's weekend attacks and as the Prime Minister resists calls to prescribe Iran's Revolutionary Guard. A sleepy Donald Trump becomes the first American president to face a criminal trial over his hush money case against porn star Stormy Daniels, and he dozed off. 
And as actress Hannah Waddingham hits back at a photographer who asked her to show a bit of leg love, we'll be asking, is catcalling flattering or intimidating? That's our debate shortly. And the National Trust has come under fire from locals as they're accused of seizing sports land and turning it into biodiversity spaces. Uh, the new discus world record has gone. I'm thinking of attempting it with a dinner plate, so maybe we'll see how we get on with 7.20. Uh, and also with the sport, Cole Palmer scored four goals against Everton last night. Three of those in 28 minutes as Chelsea wins 6-0. Uh, there's the athlete that's responsible for Team GB being disqualified from winning a silver at the Tokyo Olympics. Looks likely to run in Paris. And Andy Murray's ankle is on the mend and he should be at Wimbledon. A chilly start again out there this morning. And like yesterday, there will be a fair few April showers around. But the winds will be easing down. There should be a bit more sunshine today. So feeling a little bit warmer. Join me later for a full forecast. <laughs> Liz Truss Blinken, you would have missed her, but she's back again. She may have only been Prime Minister for 49 days, but she's brought out a book, and the book is called Ten Years to Save the West. Yeah, in this book, Truss claims she was the only Conservative in the room as she explores her time in government from Foreign Secretary to Prime Minister. Well, last night she spoke to Nigel Farage. Uh, she'll speak to him again tonight, and here's what she had to say so far. I was the only Conservative in the room yeah. for many years and it's not working. You know, the West is weak. Uh, we're seeing authoritarian regimes on the, on the rise. And what we're also seeing is in our own societies, our very values being undermined. You know, the things we believe in, our nation, the family, individual freedom, all of those core values are being undermined. And that is what my book is about. I hate being told what to do. Yeah, I know. And I hate more. the government telling other people <laughs> what to do. And having well, spent 10 years in the government, I can tell you it generally doesn't know best. We've had a white hall that's been shaped by being in Europe, you know, essentially supplicants to Europe. And it's almost like, what is that syndrome when you become a hostage and you start to love Stockholm. your... Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. It's almost like that. You know, mm. Officials were constantly looking to Brussels for validation. And you know, all of that needed to change. Well, let's get the thoughts on all of this from our political correspondent, Olivia Utley. Good morning, Olivia. Uh, what's Liz Truss up to? I mean, she's probably one of the most unpopular modern politicians. A lot of people, rightly or wrongly, blame her for the collapse of the economy after her disastrous mini-budget, and, and they talk about mortgages and the impact on that. Is this about, you know, restoring her reputation, or has she got ambitions to get back to the top of government? Or what's going on, do you think, here? Well, I think a large part of it is about restoring her reputation. And actually, quite a lot of what she says, both in her book and in that interview, will resonate with plenty of Conservative MPs, even those who don't really like her. There are lots of Tory MPs I've spoken to who talk a lot about the, this idea of the blob that's controlling the UK, the idea that sort of civil servants, technocrats, quangos are the ones who are actually in charge and elected officials are essentially run by them. Liz Truss sort of takes that idea a step further in that in this book. She talks about the deep state and she says that she thinks that Britain should scrap the OBR, the Office for Budget Responsibility and the Supreme Court. She doesn't like these these big uh, technocratic organisations, which she says is stopping the, the democracy working as it should. Well, that idea probably will go down pretty well in certain quarters of Westminster, particularly as she also said she would like to see Britain leave the ECHR, an idea that is very popular with Conservative backbenchers. As you say, though, personally, she is very, very unpopular over here. And I think the idea of her uh, making a sort of return to frontline politics here in the UK is pretty fanciful. It could well be that in publishing this book and coming up with this kind of uh, ethos of, for life, really, a kind of world view she's published here, she's looking to ingratiate herself perhaps uh, over the Atlantic. Perhaps she is thinking of a, a move to America. She spent a lot of time in America since she uh, started down as Prime Minister. She might fit in quite well in a White House run by Donald Trump, maybe, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. OK, Olivia, thank you very much indeed. More from Liz Trust, 7 o'clock tonight on the Nigel Farage Show. Let's uh, talk to the chair of the Labour Party. We say good morning to Annalise Dodds. Annalise? 
Good morning. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, actually, I don't know why I'm laughing here. I'm looking at, um, uh, because of Liz Truss, uh, the number of families who have lost their home shot up by a quarter as a result of her, her mini budget and the soaring mortgage uh, interest rates that followed it. So I presume you wouldn't be one to trust Truss. I'm afraid not. And I think the lack of responsibility that's been taken by Liz Trust for the harm, frankly, that was impacted on people in our country is absolutely astonishing. You know, as you said, we've seen now those figures showing that actually repossessions shot up by over a quarter, 26 per cent following that mini budget. Of course, that's just a figure. But for those families, that meant losing the home that they believed was going to be theirs for many, many years, for decades. It meant that they ultimately have suffered from that awful, awful financial impact. And it wasn't a natural financial impact. It was one created by politics, created by Liz Truss and the Conservative Party. Interesting because, I mean, Liz Truss says that essentially all she was trying to do was carry out a lot of the things that, say, Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt would also try and do, but she just was blocked, obfuscated by the, the blob, Whitehall, the OBR, and that actually politicians no longer have any power. And she thinks that's quite alarming. She talks about the, the, the deep state being the one that actually led to her disastrous mini-budget, not her policies in and of themselves. Well, I think that's bizarre conspiracy theory, to be completely honest. I think just about any economist or business person that you speak with would have a very different view. I would agree, however, that Rishi Sunak certainly hasn't learned the lessons of that Liz Truss period because, of course, he's put forward a huge unfunded tax cut, £46 billion, pounds, not said how he would pay for that or whether he'd be putting up taxes elsewhere to pay for it or slashing public services. So certainly the Conservative Party's got to do a lot more to learn from the impact, the awful impact of that Liz Truss period, particularly on family finances. Uh, your plan is to get Britain building again, uh, one and a half million homes over the next um, few years, if you can do that. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Apparently, you're not. Apparently, it's impossible to sleaze on air because you're so nervous. The adrenaline. We're way too kicks relaxed, in. aren't we? So we're way too relaxed here. Sorry, <laughs> I Annalise. Yesterday, um, uh, really, really, we're talking about affordable housing for the next generation. We look at these awful interest rates, the amount of people losing their homes, and we're saying, what can you do about that? Well, we believe that we can get Britain building again. We set out those plans to do that. We need to have planning reform, first of all. We've set out how we would deliver those changes once in a generation changes to our planning system so that we can get building the homes that we desperately need, genuinely affordable homes and social homes above all. We've also set out how we would be delivering new towns as well to be delivering those homes, how we would get the skills needed to deliver them with Skills England and the plans that Bridget Phillipson has been setting out in that area. We don't think we have to accept as a country being held back in the way that we have been over the last 14 years. We think we can be far more ambitious, actually, for our people to grow our economy, put it on that much more secure footing, and, as I said, to get Britain building again. Um, I just want to ask you about Angela Rayner. I see she's out and about with uh, Rachel Reeves today uh, talking about all of this um, family finances and repossession. And I just have to ask you, because um, it remains in the headlines, doesn't it, her own personal situation. And we know the police are investigating what went on with her second home, whether she uh, avoided paying tax. She said she'll step down if she's committed any crime. But what if she hasn't actually broken the law but she has lied. Her own aide has claimed that she has lied. And this is somebody that called for an integrity and ethics commissioner. What, Public what, life, what that she won't lied? work. What, what, what? I'm saying if it's found that she's lied. I'm just asking Annalise Dodds. Well, I've got full confidence in Angela Rayner. I know that she will welcome the opportunity, actually, to set out all the detail on this. And, of course, uh, as you mentioned, there is a police uh, investigation into this and she's going to be setting out all of that detail. But, 
You know, I have to say, there will be lots of people watching this who will understand that families actually are created in many different ways. Families sometimes break up, families sometimes get together. That's what's happened with Angela Rayner. It's what's happened with many people, I'm sure, watching this. And frankly, I just think the Conservatives here are trying to adopt a kind of plague on both your houses politics when most people are not that interested well, in how much except time Except there's a principle a that I'm asking you about. Husband 10 years ago, you know? No, but there's a principle I'm asking about. I'm not so necessarily even talking about the specifics. I'm saying if a crime hasn't been committed, but she has lied, somebody who stands to be Deputy Prime Minister in potentially the near future, you know, somebody who's called for an Integrity and Ethics Commissioner and whose own aide, former aide, has alleged that she lied, should that so be I, grounds I, I to stand what, what, down? What way has she lied? I'm just interested. What, what... I'm, I'm not saying she hasn't said... But you said a former aide has said former she lied. former has said she's lied, yeah. Well... But what has she lied over? This housing issue, Eamon. But I'm asking it, the minister, no, not you, no, with respect. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to clear this up for the viewers and listeners. Yeah. What is the crime she's supposed her to have committed? Her former aide has contested her version of events, which is what she's presenting to the public this morning, which is that she hasn't broken any laws or indeed avoided paying the tax that was due. Now, my question is, if police find that she hasn't broken the law, fine. But should she stand down if she is found to have lied? Look, I believe that Angela Rayner is someone who will always do the right thing. And I know her really well. I've known her for many, many years. And as I said before, the point I was trying to get across was that, you know, of course there is now this focus on Angela Rayner's private life. And as I mentioned before, she's been in a situation where a family's broken up, a family has reformed. That's the reality of modern Britain. There'll be many people watching this programme and that's how their family has been created. And I just don't think that exactly how much time Angela Rayner spent with her husband 10 years ago really is something that many people are interested in right now. You know, they're worried about the cost of living, whether their money's going to stretch to the end of the month, whether they're going to be able to get a GP appointment. This really is, I think, a distraction that's coming from the Conservatives because they don't want to be talking about those other big issues because they haven't got any plans to deal with them, but Labour has. Annalise Dodds, thanks for your time this morning. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, some breaking news coming in Pleasure. from the Office of National Unemployment. The rate of unemployment in the country rose to 4.2%. That's in the three months of February. That's up from 39 in the previous three months. Hannah Guterres Reed, the armourer for the film Rust, which saw cinematographer Helena Hutchins shot and killed, has been sentenced to 18 months in prison. The set weapons handler was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. The actor Alec Baldwin will also face a manslaughter trial in July. A judge has ordered Prince Harry to pay 90% of Home Office legal costs after losing a case over the Home Office cutting his personal security. The Duke of Sussex had argued the court should reduce the amount he was required to pay by more than a half. MPs today will debate some of the strictest tobacco laws as the Prime Minister plans to ban Generation Alpha. That's those born after 2009 from smoking. Rishi Sunak faces the prospect, though, of another rebellion from Tory backbenchers on the matter, and he may need to rely on Labour votes to secure the passage of his flagship policy. And the weather is literally all over the place. Windy, rainy, sunny, windy, rainy, sunny. <laughs> and that's the bit goes round and round. Let's get the hail. And the hail, <laughs> all sorts of things. Let's hail Alex Deacon. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Another fresh start out there this morning. Many of us seeing sunny spells. There will be a few showers, but it's not as many, not as heavy as the ones we saw yesterday. Still, it's a bit of a wet start over parts of Lincolnshire, down through East Anglia. A fair few showers scattered across Wales as well. We'll see more coming into northern Scotland through the day. Still a fairly brisk breeze, but not as blustery, not as gusty as yesterday. We should see some decent spells of sunshine over parts of North Wales. Uh, northern England and southwest Scotland. Temperatures still struggling a little bit, feeling fresh in that breeze, but generally with a bit more sunshine, the wind's a little lighter than yesterday. It does feel a little warmer, or it certainly will do by this afternoon. 
Going to turn quite chilly overnight, though. More showers packing in across northern Scotland with a, a gusty wind blowing here. We'll see a fair few showers drifting across northern England and Wales through the night. They'll crop up across parts of the south during the early hours. It will be uh, a chilly old night, though. Four or five in towns and cities, lower across parts of northern England, southern Scotland. A hint of blue on the chart. Some rural spots could easily start below freezing uh, tomorrow morning. So again, a chilly start, but for many quite a sunny start tomorrow. Main exception to that will be Northern Ireland. Cloud moving in here, uh, a dull, damp day, and some of that rain will spread to southwest Scotland, North Wales later on. Sprinkling of showers over parts of the east, but again, many places dodging the showers dry and bright, but again, for most, on the cool side. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. OK, the Great British Giveaway continues to be given away. Yeah, it's a great big escape, this one. £10,000 luxury Greek cruise plus a travel bundle and a whopping £10,000 in tax-free cash. It is our biggest prize so far of the year. Here's how it could all be yours. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Indeed. Good luck. That's still to come. Yeah. What do you think about cat calling? I'm not sure exactly what it means. Is that like wolf whistling? Wolf whistling and, you know, things like, um, oh, what's her name? The star of Ted Lasso. Hannah Wadd Waddingham. Hannah Waddingham, Waddingham being told, you know, show us some leg love. But only thing I want to say about that is I like Hannah very much and so everything do I. else. But there is, uh, she is showing a leg. She was showing in, a bit of leg, in many, she? in many pictures. So I'm sort of wondering if that's what he was expecting that she does when she posed for a picture. Uh, was the photographer particularly out of line by by saying that? I mean, she decided not to do it. I mean, there's one of mm. Donald Trump's girlfriends as well in front of the um, the uh, the paper today in front of the Times showing a leg. Um, what is? I mean, pff, I don't know. I don't know. So is it flattering or insulting? We're going to have a hot debate about that with two feisty women just after this. Lizzie Cundy and Paula London. I'm Stephen Dixon and thanks for joining us on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. 
With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Now, a red carpet moment during Sunday's Olivier Awards in London has kicked off a fierce debate about the host, Hannah Waddingham, uh, of Ted Lasso fame and other shows. She was heckled by a photographer. Let's take a listen. <laughs> Oh, she got in a rage there. Um, so the, I think the understanding that we have is there's an official lineup on the green carpet, as they had there, where the press photographers will say, over here, and you look at all the cameras. And this was after that little thing had happened, and one of the photographers said, show us some leg. And she said, oh, my If God, anybody showed it that to you, don't be, you I'd have shown them some leg. <laughs> well, yes, but I, there are, I think perhaps she was being a bit touchy there, is my personal opinion. But I do think there are situations where it's really quite intimidating. Um, let's get well, to Well, but you see, the, women. the thing is, they come back, and you won't be able to see this, but there's a picture of Hannah, and she is showing a leg. Yeah. So is it an instruction, a request from uh, the photographer? And, I mean, to say you wouldn't ask a man that, well, of course you wouldn't. With no one's, trousers. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and who's interested in my leg or anything else well, that I've got know, to Well, you never know, You never know. Let's talk to the TV personality and columnist, and, indeed, our friend Lizzie Cundy, as well as the broadcaster, and not sure of an opinion or two, Paul at London. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, go on then, Lizzie. What did you think of all of this? Well, I think Hannah was totally oversensitive. It was over the top and over dramatic and unnecessary. Um, look, she's not dressed up like that to do the ironing at home, is she? She wants to get pictured and she's put on a dress that has got a slit in it. If she didn't want them to say, you know, show us your leg, then wear a trouser suit. That You know, you, she's got to play the game and she'd be the one that would be so upset if she wasn't in any of the papers the next day. And obviously, she, you know, this worked for her because she got everywhere. But, mm. you know, if she, if she wasn't happy, she should have worn a trouser suit. Not a dress with a slit. I disagree. She was the host of the show. She wasn't just the guest, so she was bound to make the press anyway. And it is disrespectful to demand, show me a leg. If she wanted to show her leg, that's fine. And also, she's an award-winning actress. She's worked very hard to get to where she is. She's in her late 40s. She's not a 20-year-old influencer. You know, some 20-year-old influencers go to events, even pay to go to Why events. Why is she showing her leg in that picture? And, yeah, but, I mean, if, <laughs> if a paparazzi exactly. asks an influencer to show me a leg, they will see it as a compliment. They'll see it as direction, but he demanded. It's not for him to demand. And he wasn't on the official press line, either. If she wants to show but, her Paula, leg, she's fine. being so... She is being over-the-top and sensitive, and you know it. There's no harm. He's just saying, show a bit of leg. I mean, come on, she's been in this industry a long, long time. She knows what the photographers matter. are like. She's dressed up to the nines, mm. and she's actually got her dress 
dress that is showing her yeah. leg. It if she didn't matter. want that, wear a trousers suit. I've I'm worn a trouser you would say that to a man. And a papa you know, loves me to pull my dress down and short. I just walked away. I'm not just going to get my boobs out because a pap asked me. I respect it's my body. It's very different saying your boob, get your boob out not than really. just show you a leg. Have it is. High Buy it my is. to your private parts. So if a man asks me to show well, my leg, no, I'm not showing doing that. Well, obviously, there are people who do that. If that request is made to them, depending on what age and stage they are at their career, they may say, this will get me in the paper. Well, a lot of people wear see-through clothes again in the press now. I just find showing bare threat for a man asking, it's rude. Mm. If a man told me to do that, I'd give him a dirty look and walk away, and I'm not even famous. OK, let's move away from Hannah Waddingham. Can I broaden it out, Lizzie? Are there ever scenarios when you're walking down the street, perhaps you're just going to Sainsbury's, minding your own business, and someone makes a sexual comment, not necessarily welcome? I mean, is it always uh, flattering and complimentary? Is it sometimes a bit gross and you're just like, hang on, I'm more than just a piece of meat? It's a bit creepy. Well, uh, to be honest, I think we're getting all a bit over <laughs> offended and over sensitive these I'm days. Aren't I'm very well happy. Yeah. <laughs> if a builder whistles at me, I'm, I'm at my age, I'm really happy about it. And if they don't, I'll walk around say, again Lizzie, and see if I they do. We, I, hope, I hope you don't mind me saying this. I can say this because we are <laughs> friends, but you're wearing the most clothes I've ever seen you wear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. I'm so covered up. My, my heating's not on because I've got builders in today, so I thought I'd put a jumper on. But, um, look, I think we're getting all a bit oversensitive, over offended. We're in this wokery world where we can't do or say anything. Look, as a woman, I feel quite flattered if I get a wolf whistle. And um, I don't get it at all offended. Paula obviously is very offended by these things. I'm quite but I've seen Paula on the red carpet. I'm not lie. Paula, I've seen you on the red carpet when they've said, you know, show a leg and you, you've smiled happily and posed for photos. I've never showed a leg if someone's oh, asked me Paula, to. what happens, well, though, when I don't you know, think they there's stop, a problem, they Stop oh, no. cat calling. They stop, you know, noticing you. There's got to be a bit of you that will feel disappointed or sad about that. And I'm sure, as I was saying, Hannah would be very, very upset if she wasn't in the papers the next day or featured in any way. Yes, she was the host of the Olivia Awards. It's one of the biggest, brightest night, full of stars, and she looks sensational. And there is really no harm in it. I think she's been really oversensitive here. Well, she's a strong, confident woman. She's worked very hard to get to where she is, and she deserves respect. If she wants to show a leg, great, but she doesn't want some random man demanding she show one. Well, will so you miss she was it right when to pull it's about. on yourself, Paula? And then maybe she should it wear a trouser suit no one, and a no. polo neck like myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't go to a lot of events, even though I'm invited. I wasn't invited to Olivia, but a standard red carpet, when you first go, it's fun, then you get bored of it. So I'm not really but that interested. Like to be invited to the Olivia. Uh, the Olivia I would like to yeah. go, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a special one, that's though. Special so, one. yes. Okay. Uh, Hannah Waddingham, an incredibly talented actress and presenter and singer. She sang before the show. Uh, began. They were they were great awards as well, um, and that's the controversy we're we're talking about. Uh, Paula, and uh, thank you very much indeed uh, as well, Lizzie. Uh, very good See to you hear soon. from both of you. Thanks, thank Lizzie. you. I'm going out with you tomorrow. You better not be showing yeah. anything. <laughs> showing all my legs, I'll tell you. Both yeah, of good them. legs as well. Oh, that red carpet. Say it. Don't you worry. Bye, ladies. Okay, Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye -bye. Right, Thank stay you. with us. Uh, we've got a real hot star coming up next. That's Paul Coit with all your morning sport. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. On the M62 in West Yorkshire, the outside lanes closed westbound after an accident between junctions 23 and 22 from Huddersfield to Rishworth Moor, causing queues. In Gwyneth, the A4871 is blocked southbound towards Bangor Street in Carnarvon because of a fallen tree. On the M6 in Warwickshire, the southbound exit at junction 3, the Coventry and Nuneaton turn is closed for emergency barrier repairs. On the M40 in Buckinghamshire, the inside lanes closed northbound where someone's broken down between junctions 1 and 1A from the Tenham roundabout to the M25 with queues back along the A40 from the Swakeley's roundabout. The M25 from Kenton to Surrey is closed clockwise from Junction 5 for the M26 to 6 at Godston after an accident. There are queues from Junction 3 for the M20. Long delays to as you divert and the M26 has been closed westbound from Junction 2 at Rootham to the M25 and that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Uh, looking back at the football last night with Paul, six in the back of the net for Chelsea against Everton. I know, really good. And, and Cole Palmer, he's the kid, 21 years old, signed from Manchester City, didn't need to steer in the summer and for £42 million. And for all the money that Chelsea have spent, billions and gazillions, this £42 million, it seems like a bargain. So he scored four goals, perfect hat-trick, one with the left, one with the right, one with his head. Scored a penalty as well, and he is some player. 6-0, Everton, you've got to be worried if you lose to anybody 6-0, haven't you? Yeah, not going well for Everton at the moment. Um, two points above the re relegation zone. Yeah, and also those two points which have been added because it's another, uh, it's another time that they've been done for this, uh, you know, for financial irregularity, so another two points. So they have now... They've now uh, argued against it, and now that's going to a tribunal, so that will come back at the end of the season, so before the season ends, because the thing is, the last thing we want is for any team to think, I've got away with it, we haven't been relegated, Aye. and then, so it needs to be sorted right. out. But they, Ta Premier League say by the end of the Talking season. Talking about getting away with it, uh, Britain's relay team for the Olympics, mm. tell us about that. Yeah, CJ Uja. Now, CJ Uja, who's a great sprinter, if you remember at the Tokyo Olympics, it was the 4 by 100 metre relay. We got silver behind Italy. Fantastic. It was a great result. Then there was a drugs test. CJ Uja was found, tested positive for banned substances. It was, again, it was, you know, how banned they were and how bad they were. It was actually a supplement they'd been taking, but it was banned. Simple as that. Can't take it. Right. So, so how, how controversial is this that GB well, have picked him for their relay team? Well, the thing is, because it was a two-year ban, he could come back. So I think it was 22 months. So he's come back. The other people that were running in the re obviously they were really unhappy about it because it's a dream. You know, they've had the silver medal snatched. He's qualified for the Olympics, but the rules say that if you qualify yeah. as a sprinter, yeah. you then qualify for the relay squad. Now we're not saying that he's going to be the team so what may happen is these qualify for the squad you may get uh, by the time we get to Paris team GB then have the right to be able to say actually um, we'd like this for so whether he's actually gonna run that because for. I mean if he could help us to win the medal and he's not got any illegal substances on board at the moment correct yeah what and, do you do and also if you and how would you feel if you're one of the sprinters that ran with him four years ago yes and you're really upset yeah, the fact the that you've lost your medal hated. but <laughs> you know that he would help it's a really tricky dilemma it's to go through awful. so we'll have to watch that good replay. news yeah. for Andy Murray though Wimbledon looks likely well it does look likely I mean this this ankle injury that uh, he picked up it was at the Miami Open 
Um, he's not... Now, this is actually it. I don't know if you remember, this was a few weeks ago yeah. and he twisted his ankle and we thought, oh, and he looked in agony. But then he pl amazingly played on after that. So he's out of the boot. <laughs> you know when they have the big protective boot? He's like out of that. my son has at the moment. Oh, yeah. has he? And the, and the surgeon said to my son, he wasn't sure if it was a fracture or a ligament. But he'll be all right for Wimbledon? Want, he said you want a bone break rather than a ligament because the bone break heals much more quickly than these ligaments, yeah, which yeah. just go on and on yeah, and yeah. on. Yeah, so, yeah. So Andy, though, mm. I mean, he's superhuman anyway. So he's out of the boot. Um, he looks like he'll be hitting tennis balls again, so hopefully he'll be OK by the time we actually get to um, Wimbledon. Today is April the 16th. Whose yes, sir. birthdays is it oh, yeah. today? Oh, do you want to play? Yes, we want to play. Let's have the first one. Let's have the first one. Let's talk, I think, Liverpool and... Oh, we're going to go with this one. Oh, we're going to go with that one. Jimmy we're going to go with the, the long-haired lover from Liverpool. Mm. You know what? Well, A few years ago... I was I, I had Jimmy Osman in the studio and I was doing an interview with him. And I said, when well, we were talking about football and Spurs were playing Liverpool, and I said, how much then that Spurs... And he said, I'll bet you five pounds that Liverpool beat Spurs. And I said, you're kidding me. So anyway, Spurs won. It was all a joke. Two days later, I don't know whether we've got the picture of this card here that I have here. Uh -huh. He hand-painted a card. Stop. Look at that. And there's a picture of Jimmy playing football. Are we going to see this? With five pounds. Have we got that? I Hopefully we have it closer up and then you'll be able to see it. Yeah. But anyway, there we are. Look, look, can you see that there? There we he are. He drew that yeah. himself. Yeah, and look, he painted it himself. There's the five pounds inside. And you, so, didn't, you didn't spend the five pounds? Well, I've kept it as a souvenir. Jimmy ah. Oswin's five pounds. I might buy you a sausage roll later with it. But okay. how old do you reckon Jimmy Osmond oh. is today? Liverpool fan, Jimmy Osmond. Well, when I was a teenager, he was the young guy. He's at least five years younger than me, I would think. 60. 60 you're going to go with? Mm, well, was guess. that Michael Jackson in the background, or am I just imagining it? No, 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 no okay. that's, that's Alan Osmond. Oh, sorry, forgive me. Never mix your Jackson like, 5 with your Osmonds. <laughs> Back in the 70s, that well, honestly, you're either one or the other. <laughs> honestly. <laughs> sorry, I digress. Uh, I'll go 58. Yeah, yeah it's, it's Michael Jackson, later, <laughs> later years. So, 61. <laughs> oh. 61. Do you want to go again? We've got to no, have okay, one more. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. talk about Liverpool. This is the other one, from the long haired lover from Liverpool to the balding headed former manager of Liverpool, Rafa. Rafa. Rafa Benitez. Ooh, Rafa. How old would you think? I would say Rafa is 70. What? Se you know, he does look a bit old. Oh, yeah. I was going to go 58 again. I'm, uh, you can go again. 65. You both need 65. to... You need to go up, you need to go down. 65. 65? Eamon, it's with you. 65 sounds a good age, yeah. 63. Ah. Oh. Well, he's had a rough paper round, hasn't he? <laughs> Do you know, oh, well, you know... I don't yeah. want to comment. He's, he's, a, he's only 63. He's only 63. Yeah, yeah. Two years younger than me. Actually, no, he's not. He's 64. I beg your pardon. Stop it. Jim, he's, 60, <laughs> I'm he's 64. No, he's not. He's 78. <laughs> Actually, you choose your age. You can be any age you want him to be. No, he is. He's 60, 64. Where is Rafa these days? He's 64 today. Where is Rafa these days? I don't know. Is he retired? I hope he's sunning himself on a beach somewhere, but he loves the football, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. I'm Googling it. I you know what we got go. coming up? Yeah. Big Pat Jennings is going to join us. <gasps> the legend. The legend, idol. our favourite goalkeeper of all time. 60 years ago yesterday, he made his debut for Northern Ireland along with your favourite ever player. Georgie. George Best. Yeah. They both played together. Both kids, one was 17, one was 18. It was 60 years ago yesterday and Pat's going to be with us. Good to me. The man with the biggest hands in the world. Big Pat. Well, we look forward to that. Good, good, good. Um, stay with us. We're going through the papers this morning. We've got Nikki Hodgson and Mark Ryan Parsons, and uh, they'll be taking us through the top stories in the news as well as those stories that are going viral. That's next. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism, when you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it? I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not 
being imposed mm. onto the wider society. And when you want, uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between Islam and Islamism, people like me, you and me, we are drawing that distinction. We're trying to maintain that distinction. But if you uh, look at the commentator from the Muslim community, some commentator, they would like to blur this line and they would ask you, what is Islamism? Where does it exist? Sorry, it does exist. Mm. We see it. And the teacher of this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, we're taking a look at the newspaper front pages this morning. Here's the eye. The West is pleading for Israel to show restraint. Uh, the Times has the Prime Minister rejecting mounting calls to ban Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps over fears it may sever diplomatic channels. Um, here's the Metro. An outrage. The Metro follows Donald Trump's appearance at his hush money trial yesterday. And the Mail calls for trans women to be banned from female sporting events following controversial comments by the Culture Secretary... And the mirror focuses on a story closer to home. The widow of a murdered man says victims of antisocial behaviour live in constant fear and more needs to be done. And, um, Ryan, I know you want to talk about that one, and this is uh, Baroness Newlove um, who's talking about this. Mm. Well, yes, her husband in 2007 was killed, uh, Gary Newlove, after thugs kicked him to death in front of their three daughters. And now Baroness Newlove is calling for changes in legislation where three reports of antisocial behaviour would trigger uh, victim support. So I think greater uh, support uh, for victims of uh, antisocial behaviour is something I think is welcome and needed, clearly. I mean, I was reading as well in the Mirror that uh, there was one victim of antisocial behaviour made 280 reports in 10 months and little action being taken with the police kind of uh, calling it uh, neighbourly nuisances in, so, in some instances. Yeah, I mean, it's such a shocking story, what happened to Baroness Newlove, and she's been so powerful as, as a victim's commissioner. But it's amazing that even after she held that post and all these years on, what is it, yeah. 18 years on yeah. or something like that, that she's saying victims still feel ignored. Yeah, you know, and we'll get politician after politician mm. talking about police numbers are up, recruitment's up, whatever, whatever, whatever. Whatever it is, it's not enough. Not mm. enough is being done. Um, not enough people and their uh, complaints are being taken seriously. Um, and if you are a victim of antisocial behaviour, street jobs, that sort of thing, if you're living in fear, let us know this morning yeah. and we will reflect that. 
Um, Nikki, let's talk about uh, the man whose face is on the front of a lot of the papers this morning, looking pretty myth. But at least in these pictures, he is awake, <laughs> because the man who <laughs> coined the phrase Sleepy Joe himself fell asleep in court yesterday, um, and he was later seen smirking at jurors. I mean, he's not happy, suffice to say. <laughs> I mean, look, if, if, a, if a juror doesn't mess his trial up or cause contempt of court, it seems like Donald Trump definitely is going to. This is the uh, criminal trial... Um, taking into account the 34 counts of falsifying business records uh, that Trump is accused of, which involved covering up two uh, alleged relationships he had with two adult stars, one of whom is Stormy Daniels, who is basically seen as a bit of a heroine in the free world at the minute, amongst my <laughs> contemporaries anyway. I know Stormy Daniels. I used to live in California and I used to work a lot of stories about the porn industry. She's a formidable figure, ri just ridiculously smart woman. When you say um, you, you know her, you, you've met her? Yes, you? yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's just, I mean, he, he, <laughs> she's got nothing to lose by this story coming out. You know, when she told her story to the press a couple of years ago, you could just see she was really in her power revealing this information mm. because it doesn't do her any uh, damage, actually, mm. to reveal what happened between her and Trump. She's obviously been quite uh, scathing about mm. him anyway. But for him, you know, this <laughs> man that, you know, he, I mean, obviously, he's not somebody that... Uh, puts himself on a pedestal in terms of family values, but obviously a lot of Republican <laughs> voters are not going to like yeah, this association. Well, you think that. Um, a lot of Conservative um, voters, but I suppose it's just a binary decision at, at the ballot box for them. Are you going to vote for a Democrat or are you going to vote for a, a, a cheating, you know, misogynist but sure. of the same colour? Probably you will. And, and obviously um, he's already been, you know, he's already been, he's already had to pay damages to a woman that who accused him of rape. It wasn't a criminal trial, but that's already happened. I mean, I think, well, the issue is that if he actually is sent to prison, then obviously he can't stand. Mm. There's a quote that she gave to the Sunday Times um, this weekend when she said, he's done so much worse that he should have been taken down for. I'm fully aware of the insanity of it being a porn star, but it is also poetic. And, you know, he famously said he grabs women by a particular part of their yes. body. He said, this particular part of the body grabbed back. <laughs> dot, dot, I mean, dot. So she yeah. obviously is enjoying the... Oh, she's uh, definitely the, enjoying uh, it. And it's been, a long, it's been a long time coming. I mean, I've, kn I've known about this before it broke. You know, I've known this for a, about this kind of happening for many years. Lots of people have in America, um, and, and I do think there are quite a lot of people that would be very much celebrating if um, <laughs> if she brings him down. I'll be honest. Ryan, there is a story in the Telegraph um, today talking about uh, the two-child benefit cap. Um, question is: Should we be paying for people to have more children? Well, Lady Blair spoke to BBC Radio 4 about removing the two-child benefit cap, and I disagree. I think we shouldn't be incentivising people to have more children if they're thinking that they're going to receive an additional income uh, and that will become a main income for them. I mean, Why? they're forecasting at the moment that child benefit spending is at £12.5 billion, and Why that's set to it? rise to... Why increase it? Sorry? Why increase it? Why, why, why are you for people having lots more kids? No, I don't want. No, I don't want. Oh, you you want no, 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 I, no, I, no. I want the reverse. I think oh, that this would. Ins I think more. I think I encouraging people to have more children because they might think they're going to get another income. Yes. Uh, I think is a, a terrible idea. I mean, this equates to about one thousand uh, and seventy pounds per child, uh, and I think people just see money uh, pound signs in their eyes. They're going to have another child. I'm going to get more money. I don't yeah. want that. It's I not mean, a lot well, of money, really. Think if you think about it, though. You know, lots of people get less than ninety pounds a month for a child. Okay, you say 90 quid's 90 quid, but mm. it doesn't go a long way to taking care of a child financially. No, but uh, one minute we're told there no, there's no room at schools, there's no room at hospitals, there's yeah. no room in the roads, we're overpopulated, we're this, that, and then we're being told, oh, pay people to have more, more children. Mm. What, I mean... It's capitalism. It's basically all driven by capitalism who want a workforce until they don't want a workforce when we've got robots doing everything that we, we all do. Well, sure. Well, that's... And it's the, it's the argument against immigration. It's saying if we don't uh, have more of our own children, we'll have to let immigrants in to do more care work and all the rest of it. That's, yeah. you know, that's what the rights are afraid of. That's yes. why they're so obsessed with women having more children. But what they could do is actually give women proper childcare and help them get back to work and give them tax breaks and all the rest of that to look after their kids rather than just saying, let's have give more. you another 90 quid for one more child. That yes. doesn't work. That's not the incentive people very want. Very sensible, Nikki. Yeah, very sensible there. Um, let's talk about trans athletes, the front of the mail. Um, there seems to be a sort of fight back, I suppose. Um, we saw last week that landmark cast review uh, in giving these um, puberty blockers to teenagers. 
Uh, and now this call to actually come out and, and, you know, show some metal on this. And this is the culture secretary um, telling sporting chiefs that yesterday. Yeah, so Lucy Fraser has come out, she's writing in the mail today saying, look, women's sport needs to be protected. Women need to be able to know that they can compete in their uh, class, in their sex class, and that their, um, their bodies are not going to be weaker than some of the competitors that may have been born as men. Mm. The problem with this is that, oh my gosh, sex is not just um, denoted by your genitals. That's what happens when we're born, right? So we're born and a doctor makes a decision about whether we're male or female. But the fact is it's also made up of things like hormones, chromosomes, internal reproductive organs. That's why in past years we've had athletes that... Uh, identify as female, present as female, were female born, but have had so much of, some, of testosterone in their body that have been ultra performers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you're going to say, well, we're definitely going to get rid of people because um, they've got this advantage in this mm -hmm. department, I think this is really dangerous. You're going to have to start measuring people's hormones and chromosomes. It's like, how do you, where do you draw the line uh, on what, what you measure you in order to decide? Can just say, if you happen to be one of the very small minority of people, um, I think in society it's something like 0.2% of people who are trans, then you have your own race, your own Well, you can, but why I mean, should it, why, you know... I, um, I completely agree yeah. with you. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the answer is, because I don't like the idea of only the trans people being together and being marginalised. There'll be enough difference, physical is difference... Is it being marginalised? Anyway. I mean, women race on their own because they're, you know, it's a fair race. Men yeah. race on their own because it's a fair competition. But then you're always going to have outliers in sport. You often get people, male and female athletes, that just have some one incredible physical quality mm -hmm. that makes them... Well, they have the Paralympians have their own race. That's true. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I, I do appreciate the fact Lucy Fraser is standing up for women. Yeah. I, do, I do appreciate that. As a feminist, it's very important to me that we don't eradicate women and silence women and mm. get rid erase women, which we are doing, we're in danger of doing with the trans debate. Yes. But I also worry about uh, making a minority of people, you know, kind of even more outcast. But I, I also think it's a generational issue. I find people my age within Gen Z or Gen Z, they they seem to think it's OK to have transgender athletes competing uh, with women. And I welcome the action that was taken by a major golfing tournament in the US, second to the US Open. And they have now banned transgender uh, golfers from taking part because there are clear physiological differences. How we... Uh, it's not at all equitable mm -hmm. for female athletes yeah, to allow... Yeah transgender athletes, whether they're golfers or any or any sport, to uh, participate uh, and, and to compete against them. It is totally and utterly unfair. I think it's just a really common sense uh, debate. But it seems to be that people my age are just uh, blinkered and they, uh, and they just want to uh, posture but, and but appear Ryan, woke. But, but Ryan, um, on, with... on that <laughs> subject, you could find yourself cancelled for those views. And I want to ask both of you, uh, Dawn French, the, the actress and comedian, uh, mm. has, talked, has talked about in the papers today how uh, a cancel culture has made her more cowardly. Tell us more, Nikki. Mm, this is really interesting cause she, because she's obviously... If you go back to some of the early um, French and Saunders com comedy in the 80s, it's pretty on the line, you know? Yeah. I mean, it really is quite provocative. They wouldn't get away with some of the things uh, that they said then now. But what she's saying is that she doesn't like the fact that, you know, in her 60s... At, what is kind of the pinnacle of her career, she's starting to self-censor. She's starting to think very carefully about what jokes she can use and what she can't. And especially as a woman, you know, when women have had to really make headway in comedy and they, you know, they've been held back for years, she feels that it's, you know, it's just kind of, it's holding people back at a point where they shouldn't have to feel like that. But I think it's absurd that comedians are even considering this. I think a part of their job description, I think that's a part of being a comedian, is that you say what's on your mind, you're there to offend, and if people are offended by it, I, I say, I get a life. I mean, how... And they don't have how to is a comedian? Well, exactly. Yeah. How are we now censoring, in this day and age, comedians, and, they, and they're unable to it's do their job and, and make though. people laugh? I mean, can you make anti-Semitic jokes, for example? Or, you know, there are areas that we all... Sure. So, so, like, I was the, brought up in Northern Ireland life. where it was just a culture of Catholic jokes, Protestant jokes, yeah. whatever. People just harden to it. People laugh at it. I mean, I, if I have respect for people in Northern Ireland, by and large, is that we are very robust uh, at the banter. Uh, we give it, we take it, whatever. It's all part of our culture. 
Um, but goodness me, where we've got to now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I worry for the, you know, for live comedy seems to be a little bit better protected because people go to, you know, they're choosing to go into an arena and watch it and, you know, <coughs> there, are, there are less problems with that. TV comedy is just so dismal. There's, I don't think there's anything on TV that I actually find funny or even provocative anymore mm. because we've become mm. so obsessed with being safe. I know, mm. but you go to TV Gold or whatever and you'll get... Fools and horses and dad's arms. Hello, hello. Even hello, friends hello. probably wouldn't be allowed I don't think today. So, yeah. There's stuff on yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, I speak from a young person's point of view, and I, of course, I have these discussions with a lot of my friends <laughs> in their twenties, and they're so petrified of speaking out against the, uh, the par you know, ra raising their head above the parapet and speaking against yeah. uh, what the majority are saying because they, they, their fear of uh, losing their jobs uh, and their livelihood. Uh, I just think it's, uh, it's a sad all on their of side. Affairs. It's all on their side. Anyway, four seconds. Got to say goodbye to you guys. See you again in 45 minutes. Alex Deacon with the weather. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Another fresh start out there this morning. Many of us seeing sunny spells. There will be a few showers, but it's not as many, not as heavy as the ones we saw yesterday. Still, it's a bit of a wet start over parts of Lincolnshire, down through East Anglia. A fair few showers scattered across Wales as well. We'll see more coming into northern Scotland through the day. Still a fairly brisk breeze, but not as blustery, not as gusty as yesterday. We should see some decent spells of sunshine over parts of North Wales. Uh, northern England and southwest Scotland. Temperatures still struggling a little bit, feeling fresh in that breeze, but generally with a bit more sunshine, the wind's a little lighter than yesterday. It does feel a little warmer, or it certainly will do by this afternoon. Going to turn quite chilly overnight, though. More showers packing in across northern Scotland with a, a gusty wind blowing here. We'll see a fair few showers drifting across northern England and Wales through the night. They'll crop up across parts of the south during the early hours. It will be a chilly old night, though. Four or five in towns and cities, lower across parts of northern England, southern Scotland. A hint of blue on the chart. Some rural spots could easily start below freezing uh, tomorrow morning. So again, a chilly start, but for many quite a sunny start tomorrow. Main exception to that will be Northern Ireland. Cloud moving in here, uh, a dull, damp day, and some of that rain will spread to southwest Scotland, North Wales later on. Sprinkling of showers over parts of the east, but again, many places dodging the showers dry and bright, but again, for most, on the cool side. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. On the M6 in Lancashire, there are northbound queues after traffic was stopped because of an accident between junctions 30 and 31. The M61 to Salisbury east of Preston. On the M6 in Warwickshire, the southbound exit at junction 3, the Coventry and Nuneaton turns closed for emergency barrier repairs. The M40 in Buckinghamshire is partly blocked southbound by an accident just before junction 4 at High Wycombe, causing delays. And there's a lane closed northbound where someone's broken down between junctions 1 and 1A from the Denham roundabout to the M25, with queues back along the a40 from Hillingdon and the M25 from Kent into Surrey remains closed clockwise from junction 5 for the M26 to 6 at Godston after an accident with queues from junction 3 for the M20. Place 2 as you divert and the M26 still closed westbound onto the M25 though they are expected to reopen soon and that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello there, very good morning to you. The time creeping up to 8 o'clock on this Tuesday the 16th of April. This is Breakfast at GB News. Eamon Holmes and Isabel Webster. Lovely to have you with us. Our top story this morning, Liz Truss. She's back. She has a new book. It's called Ten Years to Save the West. And it's a tell-all about her time in government. The West is weak. Uh, we're seeing authoritarian regimes on the, on the rise. And what we're also seeing is in our own societies, our very values being undermined. Suella Braverman claims or slams the Prime Minister for lacking the political will to ditch the ECHR as the Rwanda bill heads back to the House of Lords. The West calls for restraint as Israel vows to respond over Iran's weekend attacks. That's as the Prime Minister is resisting calls to prescribe Iran's revolutionary guard. A sleepy Donald Trump becomes the first American president to face a criminal trial over his hush money case against the porn star Stormy Daniels. And in the sport, Cole Palmer scores the perfect hat-trick. One with the left, one with the right, one with the head. As Chelsea puts six past Everton, six. Uh, the Champions League starts getting exciting again tonight. And the band athlete that looks likely to compete for Team GB in Paris. And by the way, the greatest goalkeeper of all time, Pat Jennings, will be with us as well. A chilly start again out there this morning and like yesterday there will be a fair few April showers around but the winds will be easing down there should be a bit more sunshine today so feeling a little bit warmer. Join me later for a full forecast. Uh, now, she may have only been Prime Minister and forced to resign after 44 days in office, but Liz Truss is back with her brand new book, Ten Years to Save the West, out today. Uh, in this book, uh, Liz Truss claims she was the only Conservative in the room in government as she explores her time there from Foreign Secretary to PM. And last night, she sat down with Nigel Farage, and here's what she had to say. I was the only Conservative in the room yeah. for many years and it's not working. You know, the West is weak. Uh, we're seeing authoritarian regimes on the, on the rise. And what we're also seeing is in our own societies, our very values being undermined. You know, the things we believe in, our nation, the family, individual freedom, all of those core values are being undermined. And that is what my book is about. I hate being told what to do. Yeah, I know. And I hate the government telling other people uh, what to do. And having well, spent 10 years in the government, I can tell you it generally doesn't know best. We've had a Whitehall that's been shaped by being in Europe, you know, essentially supplicants to Europe. And it's almost like, what is that syndrome when you become a hostage and you start to love Stockholm. your... Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. It's almost like that. You know, mm. Officials were constantly looking to Brussels for validation. And it, all of that needed to change. Don't forget, she did vote to stay in the European Union uh, just a few years ago. Changed her views significantly since then. Uh, let's hear what the uh, Labour chair, Annelise Dodds, had to say about all of this. She Sunak certainly hasn't learned the lessons of that Liz Truss period because, of course, he's put forward a huge unfunded tax cut, £46 billion. Not said how he would pay for that or whether he'd be putting up taxes elsewhere to pay for it or slashing public services. So certainly the Conservative Party's got to do a lot more to learn from the impact, the awful impact of that Liz Truss period, particularly on family finances. 
Well, joining us now is the writer and presenter Connor Tomlinson and the former Labour Party advisor Scarlett Maguire. Welcome to both of you. Um, let's start with you, Connor. Um, you'll be buying this book and, and you subscribe, I suppose, really, to a lot of what she's saying, that she had strong Conservative instincts and it was effectively the blob uh, that took away all of her power. I will be reading it. I think Liz, you're right, had the correct instincts, particularly on things like the trans issue, being one of the only people ahead of the CAST report, or after the interim report rather, to put forward a private member's bill that bans social transition and surgeries for children and trans competitors in women's sports. Uh, she had the right instincts on government spending, on scrapping the ECHR, scrapping a lot of the institutional reforms that Tony Blair put through that have hooked our country up to unaccountable quangos, both in the civil service and abroad. Uh, Liz's problem, and I say this without trying to be rude, is that she wasn't wise enough to how power actually works. And you're right in that she was an anti-monarchist when she was younger, she was uh, in favour of the EU a few years ago. As of stepping into government, she kind of presumed in almost Trumpian way that the government would just do what she said, because now she's in charge. And she didn't realise that it's her Robert Conquest third law. Actually, neutral institutions aren't neutral, and they're often controlled by the enemies of their stated purpose. And I think now that she's been badly burned, um, were she to, and she's projected to keep her seat, one of the few Tories that are projected to keep her that seat after this massive wipeout, uh, she might be the conduit through which people who understand how politics actually works can act on her correct instincts. Uh, well, let's get the thoughts of Scarlett Maguire and all of this. Um, you are an outspoken critic of Liz Truss. What do you make of this comeback? Um, some people, I think there was a quote, Harry Cole of The Sun, saying that um, she had the opposite of imposter syndrome. I know. I mean, I, most people, having crushed the economy after <coughs> mere 44 days in government, would show some humility. Instead, she says anybody who believes she crushed the economy uh, is either malevolent or ignorant. I mean, I remember those days. I, I, I mean, I remember being at the Labour Party conference, watching the pound slide down, and then I read her memoir, and she goes, well, it, you know, it wasn't that bad. It was, it was so bad that we stopped laughing and thought there's going to be no money left for us. So she had no... She, I mean, it is really, really frightening what she did. She was absolutely run by an ideology that no... I mean, you know, she found Patrick Minford, one economist, to back her up, all the rest of the economists. And then, and then she sort of thinks as though the markets are run by left-wing Remainers. It is really, really scary how little she understands. Um, Connor, what do you say to that? I mean, we also had Annalise Dodds a little bit earlier claiming that there'd been a 39% rise in homes being repossessed as a direct result of the uh, mini-budget that Liz Truss presided over. I'd need to see that stat and see a proper breakdown of it. I, again, find it very hard to believe anything that Annalise Dodds said, again, considering she's been routinely wrong on the trans issue and then hasn't backed off of that. She has no humility. I mean, in terms of start the criticism Liz Truss crashed the economy, no, Liz is actually right in that the Bank of England conducted a very strange and unique to the world policy of selling guilt while at the same time conducting, well, to conduct quantitative easing. Uh, while at the same time raising interest rates. They're walking a very fine tightrope to deal with the massive spending that was conducted during lockdown. And on the brink of it breaking, it coincided with the mini-budget, and they decided to, in a very monocausal way through the media, slap that on there and resume business as usual with their preferred candidate. And you can tell this because suddenly Rishi Sunak, the man that was behind the recession as Chancellor, who overspent irresponsibly during lockdown, was ushered in and then committed to massive spending rises over the course of decades, which were not funded, including trillions in climate reparations to Pakistan, and nobody blinked an eye. It's because, yes, there is an international consensus on how business and finance should be run. There is a sort of managed decline attitude. And Liz Truss stepped on that landmine without understanding how politics works, without knowing she stepped on the landmine, and it blew up straight in her face. And I think now that she's very vengeful, um, she might be able to play some role in reshaping the Conservative Party to an actually Conservative image after they suffer a pretty deserved defeat. Well, do you think that's her ambition? I mean, so she's clocked on to, uh, you know, my implementation of policies is a disaster they don't work, but the ideas are quite popular amongst lots of disaffected people, and that would include getting rid of the governor of the Bank of England. Yeah, I think that she understands how it works, and this is what Popcorn's about. Like, this whole Popcorn launch thing... Just to explain, um, this is popular conservatism, which is a group, a wing, another group within the Conservative Party, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, I, you get caught in the Westminster bubble and sometimes throw out these small phrases. Uh, the actual sign-ups to it are quite small, but the money and influence behind it is quite sizable. And that's because 
in many of these spaces, lots of people are just holding their breath for the election because they, they think it's a lost cause. Like Everyone knows the Tories are going to get wiped out. So after the soil's been completely deracinated, we can replant seeds. And that's what Liz is thinking. She's clearly thinking that in a jockeying for the post-loss leadership contest, that someone she is allied with and someone that people in the popcorn movement are allied with, the sort of hopefully lower migration, even though it's a bit shaky, anti-woke, lower taxes cohort, will be able to put up a candidate to fend off the sort of post-Cameron establishment continuity candidate. And that's mm. what she's trying to do. But, I mean, the reason is it not that everybody's predicting that Labour's going to win the next election is because, as you point out there, Connor, it's a minority that are in favour of those kinds of positions, even if they are quite well-funded. I mean, Scarlett, you know, he talks about the establishment position, but that is ultimately what Sir Kistar and Rachel Reeves are trying to uh, put forward themselves, isn't it? Because they think that will win them... It's the return to the centre ground where you win elections. Scarlett. Yes, I mean, <laughs> sorry, I thought you were still talking to Connor. Yeah, I mean, the, the centre ground is, is, is where you win elections, so I, I think you can go rather more left wing than, uh, than, <laughs> than Keir is going. But the problem, the, I mean, what we have to remember with Liz Truss is that she was absolutely out on a wing, is that, that, that she had very, very little support from anybody who knew what they were talking about. I mean, economists, there are left wing economists, there are right wing economists. But, but seriously, nobody, nobody thought she was on something. Business, which is not a left-wing woke thing, uh, yes, didn't trust her at all. I mean, nobody, the people who, who, are, who are in charge, who are going to give money to this country, are not going to trust her. You say it's a left-wing thing, Connor. I mean, I can think off the top of my head, um, Bamford, huge JCB investor, he was pro-Brexit, Sir Michael Hintzy, a big hedge funder, billionaire in London, also pro-Brexit. Because of global Britain. But you can't just say that, that, that business is, is lefty Remainer. I can. Well, no, no, not Remainer. Hang on a minute. I didn't say Remainer. I said left wing because they're all signed up to ESG scores, environmental social governance scores. That basically means you have to conduct left wing activism in order to get subsidised by the hedge funds. And a lot of the time, especially in the Conservative Party as well, because lots of them are liberals. I mean, Liz Truss is a liberal. She helped run the Hayek Society. Um, they only wanted Brexit for global Britain. So they wanted fewer EU regulations to sign themselves up to the global market, the free exchange of people, irregardless of culture. And I think Liz is starting to realise because she's now her instincts are more aligned with people who understand how power works, mm. but that also wasn't the way to go about it. And I think she can be influenced in a way that so, it returns so Scott, to... what is her Brexit. game? What is she playing for? What is she... Wish? Is this a political comeback? Will yeah. she stand again I mean, at the election? Will she go to America? What do you think? It, I mean, it, it's shocking, isn't it? She's like Boris Johnson. She's waiting to be called back. Mm. I mean, this in, instead of thinking, yes, I really, really screwed up, and frankly, I screwed up the country while, while I was at it, she's saying, no, 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 you don't understand. I mean, I mean, actually, it's not like she came in from outside. She'd been foreign secretary. She'd been in. She'd, she'd been, been in the cabinet. She'd years, been in the cabinet. Yeah. She'd been a minister. She knew how power worked, and the fact that she didn't understand it, and what she. I mean, it was completely. She did not have to do a mini budget straight away. She didn't have to act like that straight away. I mean, she actually could have tried to do it, and then she objects because the governor of the Bank of England said that actually having having the, the the civil servant in charge of the Treasury who didn't know anything about the Treasury would be a bad thing. I mean, she just blames everybody and sees conspiracies where actually she was trying to be given advice. The only advice that she was given that she accepts, which she didn't take, was, of course, from the Queen, which said, pace yourself. Well, uh, she's pacing herself again on GB News tonight, 7 o'clock with Nigel Farage. Thank you both very much indeed for your views and your predictions as to what's happened in your analysis, but Thank we'll leave you. it there. Thank I'm you both uh, very much. I'm just looking quickly at some of the views coming in, and Leslie says, Liz Truss is right, but not the person to deliver that change. Perhaps a few of you will share that view. Get in touch. You go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. Do you trust, trust Liz Truss? There you are, gbnews.com forward slash have your say. World leaders have called for restraint as Israel vows revenge against Iran following Saturday night's attacks. The Israeli military chief has said the country is still considering what it will do next, but confirmed the attack will be met with a response. While well, speaking on Patrick Christie's programme last night, the former Armed Services Minister James Heapy urged for Israel to remain calm. What could have been a sort of Pearl Harbour-type moment was 
repelled. And, they, and, and as a consequence, gives Israel the opportunity to not respond and, and escalate. Now, Israel may still choose to do so. I think the UK should be absolutely clear in our resolve to continue to be willing to defend Israel from these mm. attacks. Always our priority must be to try and... So you support them in defensive action, less so in offensive action? Yeah, look, I think, I think I mean, your question was, should we be making a commitment to go with the Israelis? I mean, I, I, I don't think we should. Okay. Let's get the thoughts of Israeli journalist Jotun Confino. Uh, Jotun, what do you think will happen next? I think we will see a strike. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to be on Iranian soil. I think it will be, but uh, either way, it'll have to, Israel will have to punish Iran uh, one way or another. What's happening right now is that the idea is presenting the security cabinet with options, which kind of options they can choose. And I believe they'll find a middle ground. Obviously, they'll present the maximum damage that Israel is capable of doing and the minimum uh, damage. And I believe they'll find a middle ground simply not to alienate the UK and the US, who have called on Israel to, uh, to, to not attack. Now, I, I do think that they know Israel will attack. They're just saying it publicly in order to, to seem as, uh, uh, as diplomatic brokers, uh, actors who don't want the whole region to, to go into a, a war. Um, and what about the comments that have come in from President Biden, indeed our foreign secretary, um, that you should take um, Israel's response to those uh, missiles as a win, and that should be that? I mean, it certainly seems um, to us here in the UK as though perhaps President Biden doesn't have the same sway that he used to have, not only on Iran, but on Israel. Yeah, I, I spoke to an Israeli official yesterday, and, and he, he commented on this particular that Biden said. He said, when the Iranians don't listen to Biden's don't warning. Why should why should Israel do that? Uh, the only the only language that Iran understands is power. And of course, Joe Biden doesn't want this to escalate. He's looking out for American interests. It's not in the U.S. interest to have a regional war, and it's not in, in the U.K.'s interest either. So it would be odd and unexpected if they said yes, Israel, go ahead and and bombard uh, Iran. They wouldn't do that. Now that being said, they know that any country facing 120 ballistic missiles, even if they are shut down, that is an act that's a declaration of war. It's an act of war. And we have to remember, there's a seven-year-old Bedouin girl fighting for her life right now. She's not killed, but she's severely wounded from one of the shrapnels from the ballistic missiles. So I don't think uh, anyone in their right mind would dismiss this attack as a, as a minor attack. And also, I think most countries, including the UK, by the way, would act pretty harshly if 120 ballistic missiles were sent over uh, London. Fino, thank you very much. We'll leave it there. Appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. In thank other you. news, the armour for the film Rust has been sentenced to 18 months in jail. Hannah Guterres-Reed was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter when cinematographer Hayley Hutchins was shot dead by Alex Baldwin. He will also face a manslaughter trial in July. The rate of unemployment has risen by more than expected. New data from the Office for National Statistics shows it's up to 4.2% in the three months to February, from 3.9%. A judge has ordered Prince Harry to pay 90% of Home Office legal costs after losing a case over the Home Office cutting his personal security. The Duke of Sussex had argued the court should reduce the amount he was required to pay by more than half. MPs will debate some of the strictest tobacco laws today as the Prime Minister's plans to ban Generation Alpha, that's those born after 2009, uh, from smoking come to Parliament. Rishi Sunak's facing the prospect of another rebellion, though, from Tory backbenchers, uh, and he may need to rely on Labour votes to secure the passage of this bill. If you're wondering what to wear going out today, let's give you a weather update. Alex Deacon. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Another fresh start out there this morning. Many of us seeing sunny spells. There will be a few showers, but it's not as many, not as heavy as the ones we saw yesterday. Still, it's a bit of a wet start over parts of Lincolnshire down through East Anglia. A fair few showers scattered across Wales as well. We'll see more coming into northern Scotland through the day. Still a fairly brisk breeze, but not as blustery, not as gusty as yesterday. We should see some decent spells of sunshine over parts of North Wales 
Wales, uh, Northern England and southwest Scotland. Temperatures still struggling a little bit, feeling fresh in that breeze, but generally with a bit more sunshine, the wind's a little lighter than yesterday. It does feel a little warmer, or it certainly will do by this afternoon. Going to turn quite chilly overnight, though. More showers packing in across northern Scotland with a, a gusty wind blowing here. We'll see a fair few showers drifting across northern England and Wales through the night. They'll crop up across parts of the south during the early hours. It will be a, a chilly old night, though. Four or five in towns and cities. Lower across parts of northern England, southern Scotland. A hint of blue on the chart. Some rural spots could easily start below freezing uh, tomorrow morning. So again, a chilly start. For many, quite a sunny start tomorrow. Main exception to that will be Northern Ireland. Cloud moving in here, a dull, damp day, and some of that rain will spread to southwest Scotland, North Wales later on. Sprinkling of showers over parts of the east, but again, many places dodging the showers dry and bright. But again, for most, on the cool side. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. To bring you uh, a breaking story, a bit of a picture story. If you're listening on the radio, uh, take a look when you get the chance safely to have a look at these. Uh, this is in Copenhagen in Denmark, and it is a fire at one of the city's oldest buildings. This is their stock exchange, which has an iconic spy you can just make out there. Uh, the two dragons, uh, twisted dragons on there, are believed to have fallen through to the ground, and firefighters are tackling a major fire. No reported injuries at the moment. Um, emergency services have been carrying out uh, large items and paintings from the building to try and save them from the flames. Um, extraordinary images there. Uh, let's bring you the Great British giveaway. Uh, you know what it's all about. If you don't, here we go. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Up next, we'll be talking to a mum and son who've just returned from the Everest base camp. He's very, very young, but he plans to climb it next. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. I'm delighted to welcome Andrew Doyle, who was behind that comedy event in Edinburgh last night. Andrew, great stuff. Look, what's the mood like on the ground in Scotland? Well, I mean, certainly at last night's event at Comedy Unleashed in Edinburgh, there was a sense of relief that we're all gathering and we're all laughing at this stuff. We're just laughing at the way that the police have approached this, the way the SNP have approached it. Uh, various people from various of the protected characteristics that you must not uh, mock or offend were mocking each other. It was just a reminder that actually these are just jokes. We're just having a laugh. We're just exercising our uh, creative freedom and our our freedom of speech. The mood, I think, is generally uh, one of disbelief that, that, mm. that Hamza Youssef and the SNB have pushed through uh, this crazy authoritarian draconian law, irrespective of all the criticisms that, that have come from senior members of the police, uh, members of the judiciary, uh, members of the public, uh, the, the QCs, various, various bodies have all said this is not workable because the police have said that they will investigate absolutely every complaint. And yeah. although they've said they won't target comedians, they're going to end up investigating comedians if the complaints come in, because that's what they've pledged to do. Well, that's it. So, conceivably, and this is how ridiculous and unenforceable it is, if someone had reported you last night in the audience, the police would have had to have investigated you, wouldn't they? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, whether they would have taken it any, any further will come down to the individual police officer. We, we had uh, Siobhan Brown from the SNP on the BBC the other day, and she was asked very clearly about this. 
you know, who makes the decision what to investigate and what not to investigate, how to take it forward? She said it's a matter of individual police judgment. Now, the problem with that, of course, is there are activists within the police force in Scotland. We've caught them at it before. Now, the fact that they're not going to pursue J.K. Rowling after she challenged them uh, is partly probably just cowardice because she's got mm. a lot of power and clout behind her. But if it, if it was a complaint about us, a bunch of yeah. comedians in a small room in Edinburgh, they might well have taken it further. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made what my person? argument for no, me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. We're going to introduce you to a remarkable young man now. When he was just four, he's not much older now, but um, his name's Frankie McMillan, and he climbed England's highest peak at four. Yes, well, he's now aged eight, and believe it or not, he's actually conquered Mount Everest Base Camp, guided by his mountain guide mother, Basha. OK, Frankie's goal is to go back and go the whole way to get to the top of the world's highest peak. So let's, uh, let's join uh, Basia. Uh, Mombasia and Frankie uh, now and say hello, good morning and congratulations, you two. Good morning, thank you so much. Good, good morning. morning. So your, your feet were made for walking and that's just what they'll do and they're going to walk to the top of, of Mount Everest then? Yeah, that's what I think. <sighs> yeah. I can see the wallpaper in your... Is this your bedroom that you're talking to us from? You dream of mountains as you go to sleep. How much of a dream come true was it for you to get to Everest Base Camp? Um, it was 100% a dream come true. Well, not like 100, 100, because I wanted to go to the top originally, but I was still a bit too small, so I had to just go to the base camp. And how did you find it at base camp? Because lots of us grown-ups, even when we're really fit, find it a bit strange, we get dizzy and feel a bit sick and all of these kinds of conditions. Were you feeling fit as a fiddle up there or did you feel a bit strange as well? I felt a bit strange as well. I had a little headache as well. So. Oh, dear. Mum, how was it for you? A bit scary taking Frankie along there? I mean, it's not without risks, even just getting to base camp, is it? Oh, yes, it was so much um, to, to prepare and get ready for. Um, it's, you know, altitude sickness is not something you can prepare for at all. It doesn't matter how fit you are, how old you are, and how experienced you are. Um, you never know how you are going to react, how your body is going to react. And taking a child obviously needs even more preparation and consideration, taking everything into account. It was a worry, uh, but I knew physically Frankie was ready for it. Uh, he, he could probably walk for 50 days non-stop. But uh, we promised to each other, then with Frankie, that as soon as we feel unwell or we are not enjoying the experience with Justin back. Um, he, all, all, all the way, to be fair, Frankie was much fitter and much 
more active than I was. He had to encourage me on few occasions to keep going. Um, we kept checking his oxygen levels and temperatures, and his stats were absolutely brilliant, much better than mine. So we were just taking it day by day, and we, we, we made it. Well, Baz here, how long will he have to wait to fulfil his dream of going the whole way to the top? Well, Frankie, do you want to tell us how long do you want to wait? When do you want to go to the top? I want to wait two years because I want to go to the top when I'm 10. And you, you'll be 10. So would you be allowed to climb the mountain at 10? Well, originally I wouldn't, but we have a mountain guide that said they'll take us if we want. <laughs> the, um, at the moment in Nepal, there is a... Uh, there is a rule that under 16 you would not be able to go up. I uh, need special permission, but um, we had to overtake something similar when Frank was uh, climbing in uh, Greece and becoming the youngest uh, Brit to climb Olympus. So I think with providing a lot of uh, documents, experience, and uh, justifying why we could possibly give it um, give it a go and get a special permission to go before 16. We know that the youngest person who's ever climbed at Everest was 14, so it just sort of gave us a little hint that it is doable and possible before 16. Fingers crossed. Well, yeah, fingers crossed. Oh, just lastly, Frankie, what, what do you like about walking? Because I think of my own kids. I've got an eight-year-old boy, same age as you, and a six-year-old, and they groan when I say, let's go for a walk, and all they want is the snacks. I have to bribe them with snacks. I just saw in that clip there you had something yummy to eat. I mean, what is it that gets you going? Why do you love it? What do you think about when you're up there in the mountains? Well, I just think of my family and I just like getting fresh air and collecting treasure. Collecting treasure? Mm. Yes. Okay. Well, look, why you, your charity, you've, um, you, you've specifically chosen the Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, to raise money for them, hiking for charity. Why did you choose, Frankie, Make-A-Wish Foundation? Well, Make-A-Wish Foundation is all about dreams and wishes. And with my dream, I want to help other people with their wishes. Such a lovely idea. Um, you're an incredible pair, Frankie, especially you. Well done. Look after yourself. Thank keep you. Practicing. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, Basha, thank you as well. And keep us posted on any future trips. We will. Thank you so much for having us. OK. Not at all. Bye Pleasure. bye. Bye bye, bye. Frankie. Cheers. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Right, uh, we're going to take a break there and we're back. We're talking to Big Pat, the legendary Northern Irish goalkeeper, Pat Jennings, live on the show next. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M6 in Warwickshire. The southbound exit slip roads closed at Junction 3. The Coventry and Nuneaton turn for emergency barrier repairs. On the M25 in Hertfordshire, there's a lane closed on the anti-clockwise exit at Junction 25 for the A10 after an accident. There are queues from Junction 27 for the M11. On the M25 from Kent into Essex, it's down to two out of four lanes anti-clockwise. The left-hand Dartford tunnels closed because of a breakdown with queues towards there from Junction 3 for the M20. Now the M25 from Kent into Surrey has reopened clockwise after an accident between junctions 5 and 6 from the M26 to Godston. There are still queues back to junction 2 for the A2. And the M26 remains closed westbound towards the M25 from junction 2 at Rutum. The queues back along the M20. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels 
we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Um, Paul and I were looking, Paul Coit, C9. Um, we're looking through some football uh, anniversaries yesterday yeah. and we came up with this thing whereby we had a picture of George Best mm -hmm. and Pat Jennings and the story was what? 60th anniversary this week of both Pat because both two of the greatest players that's ever been, of course George Best yeah. and Pat Jennings in my opinion the greatest goalkeeper that's ever been both Northern Irish. Yes. See, that's, that's your big three. You, Pat, George. Uh, uh, and the, and the uh, thing is, they made their debut on this day for Northern Ireland 60 it's, years it's ago. An incredible story. Let's, uh, talk. 60, I dread to think how old that makes Pat Jennings, but he doesn't look any older than He I looks remember. exactly the same as he's always done. If you were a Spurs supporter, a Watford supporter, a, an Arsenal supporter, this man will have played a big part in your... Indeed, a Shamrock Rovers supporter as well. Look at him. He'd have played a big part in your life. Pat, good morning. Lovely to see you and Hell happy yeah. anniversary. Thank you. Can't believe it's 60 years. Unbelievable. How old were you, Pat? Uh, just the 18. Gosh. That makes you 57 years old now, Pat. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah, what? I, wish, I wish, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, tell us about the, the debut, because we, we mentioned it was you and George Best. Who would have thought that you made your debut on the same day? But the thing is, your route there, though, I think you were playing for Northern Ireland, though, before you'd, you were playing in the First Division, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I was at Watford in those days, and uh, just the 18-year-old, and... Northern Ireland had just lost the last uh, British Championship match against England, 8-3. And the great goalkeeper himself, the great Harry Gregg, mm. he was in goal. So I've often thought since what he must he must have thought about me getting picked in front of him, uh, an 18-year-old in the third division at Watford, taking his place in the team. But uh, that was the way it was in those days. And I don't think, I think there was, a, the manager didn't pick the team. There was a selection committee. So, but uh, for me, it was just the next game and that was it. Couldn't believe, couldn't wait to, to get the play for Northern Ireland. How, how did you do in that debut? We, we beat uh, the great Wales, Cliff Jones and Mike England, my ex uh, Spurs team. Mates. They were in the Welsh team that day. And at every opportunity, I remember, remind Cliff that would beat them 3-2 on the night. Gosh, gosh. Close one. Pat, we were, I saw, we saw a statue there in Newry. Lots of people, a lot of these statues don't look anything <laughs> like the players. But this one, my friend, which was unveiled earlier this year, it's the spit of you. It's, it's good. Fabulous. And it, it demonstrates something I want to ask you. When I was a kid growing up, and we talk about goalkeepers, people, people would often say, you know, when Pat Jennings was young, his parents used to say to him, Pat, go out and get a handful of coal for the fire. <laughs> Did you, how big are your hands? Show us your hands. Uh, they, they weren't big enough. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. But Still Pat, on but... one piece as well, which is good. Yeah. I, I even after, mentioned that, though, after, about... Sorry, after sorry. 1,100 games, so... 
1,100 games. And 119 for Northern Ireland as well, which yeah. was only broken recently. But that thing you used to do... See, the thing with Pat, and you remember that, Pat, you, you would one catch half. it with one, one hand, yeah. but it wasn't actually a catch, was it? Because, because you played the Gaelic game, it was a technique, wasn't it? Yeah, just time, and the same as people controlling the ball with their feet. I mean, big hands that, that people can do it with a size 6 to a size 10 or 11, just the same as it's timing. So, yeah. um, because it was brought up to the Gaelic game, played out midfield at Gaelic, and I'm taking all the knocks and compete with everybody going with a hand. So, I didn't realise how beneficial that was going to be to me whenever yeah. I started playing serious soccer. Yeah. But I never I never contemplated, I never thought uh, professional football would, would be available to me. Really? Really? And what about, you yeah. mentioned all those games you played and all the training you would have done and all the shots you would have stopped. Players get injuries to their knees, to their ankles, to their backs, whatever, whatever. Did, did you injure your hands much? Is there any lasting effect of ball stopping on your hands? No, I haven't got it. They're all completely intact. I haven't broken any fingers. Uh, 1,100 games, so... That's I'm, how lucky I was. Yeah. Just looking at the size of his hands. Look at all the size of my hands. I've got like really tiny. <laughs> Show us your hands I'm again, Pat. Let's see. And the sill weren't big enough. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. I'm the same. I'm exactly the same. <laughs> Finally, Pat, one, one more for you. And of all those 1,100 games, two World Cups, FA Cup yeah. wins, everything else, yeah. what's the pinnacle for you? What's, what's the greatest thing? I mean, we saw the statue, which is just marvellous. And we, we said, what a lovely statue it is in Uri. But for you as a, as a player, what was the pinnacle for you? You, Pat. Well, in the first place, I suppose, making the, the 67 Cup final, beating Chelsea. I mean, in, in those days, the FA Cup was, a, was that was the competition that everybody wanted to win. Yeah. And that match was shown around the world on match days. So that was a massive competition in those days. And then, of course, qualifying for Northern Ireland for the World Cup and showing the team with George in 64. We've been trying to qualify for a World Cup every four years after that. And I thought whenever it got to 36 that those it was never going to happen. Yeah. Then we actually made it for the 82 World Cup and to go out and beat the host nation Spain on the night. It was just what a, what a Amazing. memory. Fantastic. You, did that, yeah. you did that with a Jerry Armstrong goal, uh, España 82. But no George there. You talked about, you know, setting out with George to play in the World Cup. You got there brilliantly, but it's such a shame he didn't, isn't it? Yeah, that's always been a regret for George, such a fantastic player, to think that he never got to play in the World Cups with us. And I mean, to be, I think Billy Bingham, the manager, did look at him for the for the 82 World Cup. But uh, he, th he thought fitness-wise that he wasn't up to it, you know. So it's more one regret for George... Such a fantastic player that he didn't get to play with us, yeah. even for half an hour in the World Cup. What, but, uh, what, what an anniversary, you... though. What, what an what, anniversary, 60. Um, but l let me ask you, how, how did you juggle, how did you live with um, the, the, the transfer from Tottenham to, to Arsenal? Is that a difficult thing, I mean, to be so well-known and have done so much for both those teams, those North London, London rivals, um, what was that like? How difficult was that to do? Well, I have to say, whenever I was told in the first place that I was I was available for transfer, it was after 13 years at Tottenham, it was the worst day in my life. I mean, I'd lived for Tottenham for 13 years and then to be told that, right, we've decided you can go. And uh, what I mean, I, knew, I had done the deal more or less to go to Ipswich and then it fell through what some of the players at Ipswich, they were playing that night and, and some of those got injured. And uh, the manager then came back to say, whatever money was spent on me, he then had to buy an outfield player. But I also had Man United come in for me and, and Aston Villa. But uh, I thought, what am I doing going up the country after all these years? The kids are out of school and the new schools. And I thought, I know exactly where I'm going over the road with the, with the Irish boys, Pat Rice, Sammy Nelson, playing with me every every week in the Northern Ireland team or every every month. And plus all the Ar the other Irish lads uh, playing the Republic of Ireland team. So I knew them all. It was like home from home. Home from home. 
He could have been a Man U keeper. It's funny, Pat. I had no idea that you played for Arsenal. What are the chances? <laughs> I, nobody, nobody ever told me that. <laughs> Pat, yeah. The best, honestly, uh, the best uh, there ever was. Brilliant talking to you. We shouldn't be talking to Pat Jennings. We should be talking to Sir Pat Jennings. Hundred percent. That man should be knighted. <laughs> well CBA and truly. should be Sir Pat. Absolutely Jennings. great talking to you, mate. Thanks for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Cheers, Pat. Thanks, Emma. No problem. Thanks, Paul. Good to Thanks see you. and happy anniversary. How many years ago? Sixty years. Ago, 60, 60 years, yeah, unfortunately. Can't believe years. it, but at least we're still here. Yeah, you're still here. Well done. Keep hanging around. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, well, that was it. Very good. You know them all, don't you? Oh, yeah. You know them all. I think we should get him on again tomorrow. Should we get him on tomorrow? Well, talk to him all day, all day long. <laughs> Put great, him in great. goal. We could have a few pot shots. Can you imagine what fun we'd have? <laughs> could have been a Man United keeper. I know. Yeah. That's how I make you feel. What if? I what know. Incredible. And I can't remember who brought him. I can't remember if it was Terry Neal who would have brought him to Arsenal. Oh, it was Terry Neal. Was it Terry Neal? Um, Northern Ireland player, Northern Ireland manager as well. But he was at Arsenal for, what, eight years or so? Mm. I mean, you know, again, mm. to be told he wasn't needed at the Spurs. Biggest mistake ever Spurs then, made. Oh, mm. Mm. You can imagine. Biggest mistake Spurs ever made. Incredible. I remember. Mm. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Paul. Enjoyed that. Great to see you tomorrow. Uh, top that tomorrow. Uh, we'll be back with a newspaper review right after this. I'm Andrew Pearce. This is GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Dalby, weekdays from 3 p.m. This new hate crime bill on women's issues. You think this is the least funny April Fool's joke in history? Yeah, although the Scottish government and the Scottish police do seem to be trying to make a bit of a joke of it when, you know, their campaign Hate Hurts is fronted by a hate monster who's a sort of cuddly, bright red, uh, Muppet-style thing. And some of the things that Hamza Youssef said about it were from a, a soft play centre over the weekend. But yeah, it's really not a joke. It's not actually clever lawyers who know the wording of the law who enforce the law. It's the police. And the police have basically not been trained on this at all. There's a two-hour online training course they're meant to have done, and lots of them haven't already done it. And we know from the way that the police have been talking about it that they're wildly overstretching what it might actually be to be, in particular, abusive, which is one of the words in the new law, and specifically on the issue of transgender identity, to claim that just noticing the fact that there are two sexes and that sex can't change is meant to be hateful. That you know, even after years of trying to study it, I can't understand why people hold this belief. But it's part and parcel of a pattern of legal measures that the Scottish government has either introduced or has sought to introduce. So it tried to introduce gender self-ID, but that was overruled by Westminster because it was out of the power of the devolved government. It's still attempting to bring in a conversion therapy law, which sounds nice but isn't nice. It actually criminalises proper ethical treatment of gender-confused youngsters. Uh, they're trying to say that uh, men who have certificates saying that their women count as women for a particular measure to do with public boards and then this uh, hate crime law which tries to make it really difficult for someone to talk in a factual reality based clear understandable way about all these measures it all adds up to a sort of an authoritarian attempt to deny the fact that human beings are mammals and come in two sexes and that recognizing that matters for women's rights especially I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made what my person? argument for no, me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back. We're going through the papers this morning in the company of the former Apprentice star and Express columnist Ryan Mark Parsons and author and commentator Nikki Hodgson. Welcome back to both of you. Nikki, um, good news story on the front of the Times. Let's start with that. Um, this is about breast cancer and being able to prevent it by 25%. Yeah, I mean, this is quite surprising and it's something I certainly didn't know about when I had my baby uh, last year. So it's a report that's come from The Lancet, which is saying that 25% of all breast cancer 
can be uh, prevented if women breastfeed. Uh, it's quite provocative in a way because obviously we have so much discussion about breastfeeding, the, benefit, the pros and cons of it, and there's a lot of pressure on mothers to breastfeed. Some people just can't. But I was never given that information, actually, that if you breastfeed, it protects you against cancer. Probably would have done it. I didn't do it, actually. I may have done it if I had known that information. Um, Did it's... you find it difficult? I just didn't want to do it because I was working here yeah. all the time. Yeah. I didn't feel like working on screen and, and breastfeeding. It's quite complicated. I'm, you know, lots of people make that decision. And also because me and my husband completely split the care of my daughter. So if I was going to breastfeed, it would have put the onus on me feeding her at night. So it meant that he could feed her at night and everybody could sleep. Mm -hmm. So it really worked for us. Um, but the other thing about this story is that Really, it's also blaming alcohol for breast cancer. It's, and it's quite shocking how much drinking increases your risk. So um, about 4,000 cases a year are entirely to do with uh, drinking alcohol. And the heaviest drinkers are 60% more likely to get can uh, cancer um, if they drink this much alcohol. How much alcohol? Uh, well, they're saying... Asking for a friend. We're saying, yeah, they're saying more than <laughs> one glass of wine a day, Isabel. Oh, so it's dear. not very much. Um, mm. Yeah, it's pretty shocking how much alcohol increases your risk. Mm. Uh, so mm. it has made me think twice, I'll be honest. Mm. But yeah, but I mean, it's good that we are, we're spending more time in investigating how we can actually stop cancer. Mm. Prince Harry spending more time in, in court, uh, Ryan Mark. Um, Indeed. Uh, basically, he's objected to, he's appealed against uh, the size of the bill that he would have to pay for, is this for his police protection or is this for his legal case? I can't remember which, it's legal bill, it's his legal, legal bill. But anyway, the judge said, you're going have to pay 90% of this legal bill. Mm. Well, he needs to reimburse the taxpayer. He now faces a bill up to £1 million. And this comes after he took the Home Office to court over not being given the same level of protection when he left the UK in 2020, quitting royal duties. Uh, the judge unequivocally threw out uh, the case after saying he comprehensively lost. And I think it's high time that we say goodbye to Prince Harry. He needs to shut up. He keeps re-emerging. Uh, he's this whiny, annoying ginger freak that just needs to go away. I don't want to hear... I, don't, I really just want him to vanish. That's, that's what I think a lot of the country would be on my side. I think a lot of viewers listening to me uh, would agree as well. I mean, why we, do, well, we always seem to be talking about Prince Harry, Meghan. They've got a new show on Netflix. They've got a brand new Spotify deal. And now he's, uh, he was seeking some protection uh, from the Home Office. He's expecting the taxpayer to fund his protection. He, he lost the case. He needs to now Yeah, uh, yeah you chose this story to talk about him. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of journalists do that because it's clickbait, isn't it? It, it gets people wound up. And so you want him to vanish, but you're also benefiting from talking about it. Well, Put it to you. Well, look, it's... It's, it, it, it's in the news. We have to talk about it. But, you know, if he if he just went away and he actually sought the life he was seeking by going to California and complete privacy, actually he's done the opposite of that by going on shows like the James Corden Late Show. If he actually sought that life, then we wouldn't be uh, discussing him because he wouldn't be appearing in the papers. Mm -hmm. But clearly he's done the total antithesis to what he said he was going to do with Meghan when he left for all duties uh, four years ago. So that's why, unfortunately, we have to speak about him because he's emerging every Everywhere. Right. A uh, story we spoke about yesterday, and we're interested in your view on this today, Nikki. Um, the LGBT flags that I think this is the Royal Stoke Hospital mm -hmm. uh, these are flying at. So um, the NHS is, is, uh, is having unfurled this banner to say, no matter what your sexuality is, and there's 21 sexualities recognised here and gender identities, you will be welcome at this hospital. Now, my only thing about this is, I don't care who you are, where you're from, what your job is, how much you earn, whatever, you should be welcome at an NHS hospital anyway. Why the need to say, to make this specific to certain people? Yeah, I mean, I agree with this. It's interesting because if you think about a lot of treatment in the NHS, it is, it's relevant, your body is relevant to some of the treatment and maybe some of your lifestyle choices and experiences are too, especially with things like STIs, for example, you do actually need, you often benefit from knowing somebody's sexual identity to knowing what their behaviours are. But the NHS doesn't work like that. It will just ask you about, do you do this, do you do that? They're not really bothered about how you identify. And that's mm. to protect people, right? It's to stop discrimination. I mean, the thing that I... <laughs> that, I mean, I'm bisexual. I know what the bisexual flag is. I have one in my house. But I don't need anybody else to fly it for me to feel OK. You could say that's because I've got bi privilege and people are generally quite... OK with bi people. But, I mean, what I worry about is there's, there's probably there's so many other minorities that maybe don't feel as comfortable in the NHS, like black people, like brown people, the way they've been treated by medical professionals in the past. But uh, what, what's, hard that, for, what's hard for the rest of us is to understand why you would go into a hospital and be treated 
any differently. Well, mm. because maybe, maybe, like I'm saying, like maybe your maybe your identity affects some of the treatment you might receive. But I, think, I, I but question certain, that as well, because, Nikki, I mean, you talk about black and brown people, perhaps their treatment in the hospital. Most doctors and nurses now are black and brown sure. people. But we know that, for example, black women, you know, suffer pain more than anybody else in the system, that black women die more readily in childbirth. You know, there are prejudices built into the NHS. But, I mean, but, this... I mean, is that... Well, is that cause of... I mean, is that because there's other things going on there? You know, are black women perhaps um, less well-educated? Perhaps they have more issues with obesity, with, with diabetes, which then has complications during birth? Or is this because they're being discriminated against because they're black? It's very... It's very easy. complicated. It's it very difficult very to pull it apart. Yeah. We don't do enough research into understanding that. But, I mean, the thing with the flag thing is, you know, look, I'm all for people being inclusive and celebratory of choices, but actually the NHS is on its knees and it's does, does it have money to print no, this kind I, of stuff and put it in the hospital? I totally agree. I think it's absurd. I think I was looking into some of these sexualities. Apparently there's 21, three of which are polysexual, demi-romantic, genderqueer. I mean, what does any of this mean? And what does a welcome well, banner actually you're, 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 achieve? You're, 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 you know, your generation does use these terms. They're yeah, well, all on dating apps. I think, all, I think a lot of Gen Z work. have mental health issues because I don't understand why we need to have over 20 different sexualities and why that needs to be displayed at Raw Stoke Hospital. Mm -hmm. I but mean, people can't even get appointments. Are, are, There's huge okay. waiting lists. I think it's utterly no. embarrassing for the NHS, uh, any NHS hospital, to be doing this. And, Who needs a work about it like that? What you're saying is, is you've got a budget, you should be spending it on making the um, the care service better. Absolutely. And that we're not talking about all of this. But <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. very good, guys. Very, very good. We're out of time. Uh, I can't believe it. It's ripped yep. through with you two really quickly. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for, you. for joining Hi. us. Uh, Nick Hod Nikki Hodson. I don't know where I'm going. You can call me Nick. That's fine. Nikki Hodson People and do. Ryan Mark Parsons. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to find out what the weather is because none of It's all of us, over the shop. It's all April over the shop. showers yeah. and a bit of hail thrown in as well. And Here's Alex D. It's only Tuesday. I know. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Another fresh start out there this morning. Many of us seeing sunny spells. There will be a few showers, but it's not as many, not as heavy as the ones we saw yesterday. Still, it's a bit of a wet start over parts of Lincolnshire, down through East Anglia. A fair few showers scattered across Wales as well. We'll see more coming into northern Scotland through the day. Still a fairly brisk breeze, but not as blustery, not as gusty as yesterday. We should see some decent spells of sunshine over parts of North Wales, uh, northern England and southwest Scotland. Temperatures still struggling a little bit, feeling fresh in that breeze, but generally with a bit more sunshine, the wind's a little lighter than yesterday. It does feel a little warmer, or it certainly will do by this afternoon. Going to turn quite chilly overnight, though. More showers packing in across northern Scotland with a, a gusty wind blowing here. We'll see a fair few showers drifting across northern England and Wales through the night. They'll crop up across parts of the south during the early hours. It will be a chilly old night, though. Four or five in towns and cities, lower across parts of northern England, southern Scotland. A hint of blue on the chart. Some rural spots could easily start below freezing uh, tomorrow morning. So, again, a chilly start. For many, quite a sunny start tomorrow. Main exception to that will be northern. Northern Ireland, cloud moving in here, uh, a dull, damp day, and some of that rain will spread to southwest Scotland, North Wales later on. Sprinkling of showers over parts of the east, but again, many places dodging the showers dry and bright, but again, for most, on the cool side. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. Trains through Sunderland have been stopped after a train broke down on the M60 in Greater Manchester. Three out of five lanes closed anti-clockwise after an accident between junctions 19 and 18 from Eaton Park to Sinister Island, causing delays. On the M6 in Warwickshire, the southbound exit at junction 3, the commentary and uneaten turns closed for emergency barrier repairs. On the M25 in Hertfordshire, there's a lane closed on the anti-clockwise exit at junction 25 for the A10 after an accident, with queues almost back to 27 for the M11. On the M25 in Kent, there are clockwise queues from Junction 2 for the A2 to 5 for the M26 after an accident earlier. The M26 still closed westbound towards the M25. And also in Kent, the A249 is closed southbound at Detling towards the M20 near Maidstone for emergency repairs causing delays. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, 
gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning. Uh, it's fast approaching nine o'clock. It is Tuesday the 16th of April and you're very welcome. The news you're waking up to. Liz Truss is back with a new book, Ten Years to Save the West, as she tells all about her time in government and she'll be telling more on GB News tonight. I hate being told what to do yeah, I know. and I hate the government telling other people <laughs> what to do. And having well, spent ten years in the government, I can tell you it generally doesn't know best. Yes, the former Prime Minister not holding back last night. But what will her words mean for her successor? Find out more with me very soon. Suella Braverman slams the Prime Minister for lacking the political will to ditch the ECHR as the Rwanda bill heads back to the Lords. The West calls for restraint as Israel vows to respond over the weekend attacks from Iran. The Prime Minister resists calls to prescribe Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Prince Harry, he's lost his bid to appeal against a High Court ruling over his security protection. Cameron Walker has the latest. A potentially costly blow for Prince Harry, but he is determined to fight on through the courts. More details shortly. And the National Trust has come under fire from locals as they're being accused of seizing sports grounds for biodiversity spaces. A chilly start again out there this morning and like yesterday there will be a fair few April showers around but the winds will be easing down there should be a bit more sunshine today so feeling a little bit warmer. Join me later for a full forecast. Now. The story we're leading with all morning. Yes, uh, Liz Truss, she may have only been Prime Minister for 49 days, but she's releasing a book called Ten Years to Save the West, and it's out today. Right, in this book, uh, Liz Truss claims she was the only Conservative in a room of government as she explored her time serving from Foreign Secretary to Prime Minister. And last night she sat down with Nigel Farage. Here's what she had to say. I was the only Conservative in the room yeah. for many years, and it's not working. You know, the West is weak. Uh, we're seeing authoritarian regimes on the, on the rise. And what we're also seeing is in our own societies, our very values being undermined. You know, the things we believe in, our nation, the family, individual freedom, all of those core values are being undermined. And that is what my book is about. I hate being told what to do. Yeah, I know. And I hate the government telling other people <laughs> what to do. And having wow. spent 10 years in the government, 
I can tell you it generally doesn't know best. We've had a white hole that's been shaped by being in Europe. You know, essentially supplicants to Europe. And it's almost like, what is that syndrome when you become a hostage and you start to love Stockholm. your... Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. It's almost like that. You know, mm. Officials were constantly looking to Brussels for validation. And it, all of that needed to change. Uh, now, Liz Truss will be speaking again at 7 o'clock to Nigel Farage here on GB News. And earlier in the programme, we spoke with the uh, Labour chair, Annalise Dodds. And I think the lack of responsibility that's been taken by Liz Truss for the harm, frankly, that was impacted on people in our country is absolutely astonishing. OK, let's now join our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, with more analysis on this. Olivia, what did you make of it? Well, it was a really interesting interview and essentially what Liz Truss did was go just a bit further than the sort of things that Conservative MPs have been saying now for quite a long time. This idea that politicians are run by the blob, uh, i.e. Whitehall, uh, these quango organisations like the OBR, uh, the Supreme Court she talked about, is a very popular idea in Westminster. Liz Truss calls that the deep state and she says that we need to basically scrap it all. She said that Britain should uh, scrap the OBR, scrap the Supreme Court, get out of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, those ideas will probably go down pretty well among certain Conservative MPs and also among certain Conservative voters. 50% of 2019 Conservative voters would like to leave the ECHR. Of course, Liz Truss herself is a pretty unpopular character in Westminster. Even those who agree with her, uh, agreed with her sort of tax cutting, massive tax cutting cutting budget thought that she did it a bit too quickly and ended up um, upsetting the market. So I think it's unlikely that this that this book and this interview will sort of participate at a comeback for Liz Truss. But she is trying to restore her reputation and it'll be fascinating to see where she goes from here. Okay, Olivia, thank you. All right, on to another controversial character, this time Prince Harry. He's back in the headlines after a High Court judge ruled he must pay 90% of the Home Office legal costs for the case regarding the downgrading of his security. So, uh, it's a failed legal bid and it could cost him in excess of a million quid. Uh, but he says he is determined to fight on. Let's speak to our Royal Correspondent, Cameron Walker. Could have been worse, could have been made to pay 100% of everything. So. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you make Cheers. of this? Well, it's a pretty hefty bill, Eamon. This all dates back, if you think, to 2020, when he stood back as a working member of the royal family. The Home Office downgraded his security, essentially, because he is no longer a working member of the royal family. Prince Harry argued that his family could not be safe in the UK. He also alleged that a paparazzi chased his car after the World Child Awards in 2021 when he came back to the UK. He sued the Home Office because his lawyers argued that he'd been singled out and treated less favourably than others. Uh, in his position. In February, the High Court ruled that the decision to change the security was not unlawful or irrational, and they were entitled to the Home Office to take the decision they did. Then yesterday, Prince Harry lost his initial bid to appeal that ruling from the High Court, and the judge uh, ordered him to pay 90% of the Home Office's costs. Bearing in mind, the Home Office's cost is paid for by us, mm. the taxpayer. Um, the Telegraph Freedom of Information request from a couple of months ago reveals that that cost is in excess of half a million pounds. Prince Harry argued, or his lawyers did, that he shouldn't have to pay 50 to 60% of that cost because the Home Office delayed providing what they thought was key information uh, for this claim and they would therefore have to adapt the claim. But the judge agreed to a modest reduction, but that was only a 10% reduction, which is why we've got this 90% figure. Uh, but Prince Harry is going to directly appeal to the Court of Appeal. So he's still fighting on. He clearly thinks he's right and he's been treated unfairly. The Home Office, I would say, uh, disagrees with that. But I think this is a, a case of, uh, is this moral or not? This is a legal case. Uh, and therefore, if the legal argument is, is solid, which the judge clearly, a High Court judge clearly believes it is, it's going to be very difficult for Prince Harry to uh, bring this forward. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, if this was my son and I was a father in all of this and I had the money to pay for this, I think I probably would just pay for it. I find it quite interesting that Prince Charles stands back from this and says, 
no, leave him, he's on, he's on his own. Do you mean pay for his security? Yeah, his, yeah. Is it legal costs? Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, he is on his own, but also Prince Harry has a lot of money from his memoir Spare, the fastest selling non fiction book of all time. So he will be getting uh, hefty uh, royalties from that. He's also got his big Netflix deal, which is still ongoing. We've had two new projects announced uh, with Harry and Meghan from that. So he does have the money to pursue these legal cases. He also has a couple of cases against various newspaper groups in the United Kingdom, and he sees it as his life's mission, really, to hold people to account, including the Home Office. But by doing that, he's also potentially bringing a bit of a hefty cost to us as a taxpayer, because this is the Home Office, who clearly is funded by taxpayers, and they're having to fork out this legal money. If Prince Harry wins the appeal, then us as taxpayers are out of pocket. OK, thanks very much indeed, Cameron. Uh, here's an interesting story we've got for you, and it's uh, a row which involves the National Trust and what is their job in society. Yeah, they've come under fire from locals in the village of Sudbury in Derbyshire after they were told that their community sports field was being taken back for the Trust to meet their eco-targets, evicting the football club that uses it. Hmm. Who sets these eco targets? I worked for the BBC a few weeks ago and uh, my travel costs were all eco targets. So that determined whether you were on a train, a plane, an automobile, where you travel first class, second class. And it goes on and on and on. And, uh, you know, from people who uh, they're just there to crunch numbers and hit these targets that nobody's imposing except on themselves. Anyway, a football team are losing their pitch over this. What do you make of it? Jack Carson with the full story. In the quaint Derbyshire village of Sudbury, there's a storm brewing between the local football club and the National Trust. This grass field might seem unremarkable, but for hundreds of years it's been part of the Sudbury Hall estate, playing host to the village football and cricket matches. Now the National Trust are planning to put an end to that tradition in the name of biodiversity, with plans for trees and plants where the football club play. Some worry it breaks a memorandum of wishes from the late Lord Vernon, whose family have lived here since 1660. Manager of Sudbury FC Tom Crutchley says he's upset at the decision. Naturally disappointed. Um, a lot. We've been here, this is our ninth year. Um, you know, we've put a lot of effort into, into here to, to keep playing, to maintain it. Um, I'm from the village originally, so personally it was, yeah, very... Yeah, it is very upsetting, not just for our team, but for future generations. But the amount of land they have here, it's over 20 acres, I believe, there's surely enough room for that and for the amount of times that we play. Because we, we play between 10 to 15 home games a year, under 2% of the time that we're here. So we're not really in the way as much. The National Trust want to support local communities um, and build strong relations. Um, and by doing this, not letting us play here, it probably doesn't help that. The proposed changes have upset local people who worry businesses in the area might also feel the impact of losing it as a community space. MP for Derbyshire Dale, Sarah Dines, says the National Trust aren't respecting the history of the site. I feel they're trampling over the wishes of historic owners who gave up this wonderful site for the nation. And for over 100 years, people have played football and cricket here. It's incredibly sad incredibly sad and it's against the wishes of a lot of people locally who've written to me from the village and uh, the I know it's a tricky issue maintaining this sort of ground but the government's given a lot of money for grassroots sport and there would be funds available to keep it as it is. It's not just plans for the sports field that have upset the Member of Parliament. Sudbury Hall lives under the branding of the Children's Country House, a decision which Dine says is disrespectful to the history of the estate. I mean this is fake to make it into a children's theme park. It's almost a reimagining and in fact that's the very words it says on their website. The house has reopened, it's been reimagined. I don't want our heritage to be reimagined. I think I think the National Trust has been it's been captured by people who have different ideas than most people in this country. In response to the concerns raised about the plans for the sports field, a National Trust spokesperson said, although the National Trust will not be able to continue running the land as a space for hire on a commercial basis, the local community will continue to be able to enjoy it free of charge for family leisure time, games and activities such as picnicking, dog walking and village celebrations. We are also looking at plans to restore the land back to a Grey 2 listed landscape, which will include grassland and the planting of new trees that will blend the area with the surrounding historic parkland. Whilst the public will still be able to roam these historic grounds, the village feels like a legacy is being snatched away. Jack Carson, GB News, Sudbury.
Come on, Sudbury. That's what I say. Um, the thing is, it was left the man who, who owned the hall initially. I mean, he left it specific in his will that that's what it should be used yeah. for. It should be used to play football. Mm -hmm. So the National Trust can say all the ones you can walk your door, you can do this, but you can do all that anyway. So just why not keep it the way it is? You're tearing the heart out of a community and, and the fact that that community mixes through their football matches and plays these matches and whatever. There's just no need for this. Mm. Let us know what you think, gbnews.com forward slash your say. Meanwhile, coming up at half past nine, Britain's Newsroom uh, with Andrew and Bev. And you've got a busy show today. Good morning. Very much, yeah. Good morning. We have. You, guys, yeah. you might have heard us covering this Catherine Burble Singh, dubbed Britain's strictest head by the Channel 4 series. She was taken to court by one student who wanted a prayer room to be provided for Muslims at the school. We're going to get the ruling on that during our show this morning. Okay. She has quite a lot of Muslim children at her yeah. school, but she argues it's a distraction yeah, and, there's and no, it's not the place no, for Nobody's them. praying. They're not mm. Christian praying, the Jewish kids aren't praying, and he said it would disrupt the entire flow mm. of the school. But if she loses, this, this ha will have ramifications for other schools, mm. other public sector bodies and organisations about mm. the right to prayer yeah. in, in, the, in the working days. Mm. It's a Massive. huge story because it's about the adults doing what's right for the children. And yeah. her argument is, I will never divide my pupils along the lines of race, religion or sex or anything. We are one community mm. at the Michaela School in North London. And she has a ritual of lunchtime where 10 of children will sit around a table and they serve the food to each other and she said we break bread with everybody to take down barriers mm. and she mm. says if i don't do that in my playground i will have the muslim kids in one corner yeah. the christian kids in another the sikh kids in another and she said unless i proactively bring everybody mm. together that's what my school looks like and this ruling today will challenge her ability to do mm. that that will be interesting this country amazes me you mean we are a christian country yeah, who allegedly. doesn't believe in god yeah and it's just uh, you know so so this is incredible. When I went to school, uh, it was a Catholic school, and therefore we had loads of um, celebrations, First Fridays and Lent and all mm. sorts of things. And, um, and you had to be going to church services and commemorations all the time. But at least we did it all together and we were yeah. all involved um, in it. But nowadays, I don't know what happens to schools. I mean, it is strange that practically nobody believes in God. Mm -hmm. And do we keep these Christian Well, and, 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 and there's moves. The Tories are now saying that faith schools should be allowed just to have children from that faith. Mm. Uh, as that because the, because the, the the whole faith thing is breaking down in these schools. Yeah, and 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 I love her ethos. And she, this school is so successful. It is the most successful state school mm. for educational attainment when they arrive in year seven to educational attainment by the time they leave after A levels. And these are kids from poor socioeconomic backgrounds, mm. all sorts of challenges in their lives. And she is an absolute role model for all head teachers around the country. And if she gets her wings clipped today, which is what this ruling will do, I would very much. Expect her to resign okay. from that position. Well, keep across that, guys. We look yeah. forward to hear how that turns out. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, one last chance whilst uh, our programme's on air anyway to get your hands on a £10,000 Greek cruise, a luxury travel bundle, and a whopping £10,000 in tax free cash. Yes, hi. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. From another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Best of luck with that. Uh, that's a winner. Would you be a loser if you buy a bra? Because radiographers are saying that bras ears should be exempt from VAT. Why yeah, they that? are believed to be essential to women's health. Why should women be paying extra for that? And the fact that there is that cost means a lot of people buy cheap ones because they don't have to pay the VAT so much, and then it causes health issues. We'll be discussing all of that in more detail after this.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. There is a, a, a kind of a Mediterranean side to that as well, because my mother came from that side, you know, a, a big family. And I think there is that sense of community where family is kind of key. And I think that's really kind of what we sort of try and continue, really. I mean, certainly with children and stuff like that, you know, Sunday lunches were always, you know, the big thing. Yeah, <laughs> really. if you go down the old camp road today. Very different. Very different, yeah. And that was quite some time ago as well, because we were very close to where the Tom Beckett was. Yeah, uh, I know. Uh, I know, the and, boxing um, upstairs and all yeah, the rest of it. Yep, 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 yep. And, um, and I did go down there not so long ago, actually, and it really is very, very different. I mean, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. I think we have a different view of things. In that Most sense. people in London, Nicky, don't even know the names of the next-door neighbours. No, true. We've that's completely true. lost that sense of community that you grew up with, yeah. that you knew. I think it's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I have to say sometimes I'm a bit guilty of it where I am now as well. You live in big houses, and yeah, I yeah. do see my neighbours, but, you know, it's not quite the same as it was back. Now, I guess from that background, you're a teenager, you want to become a hairdresser. Yeah, that's, That must that, have been that, quite a difficult call. Yeah, that one was a really good, a really good call. My dad went, oh, God, what? I mean, it was just very funny. And, and certainly from the point of view of, you know, this was the early 70s, and yeah. so it wasn't really that kind of... The choice of most that most people would do. No, but you did. But why? I don't know. Actually, I mean, actually, I went to a grammar school and um, I didn't do as well in the final um, uh, exams, and I was kind of forced into sort of leaving. And you suddenly go, Ooh, no idea what to do here. Really. Yeah. But the idea of doing something in fashion, and you know, I really kind of, I, I know that I was given some really good advice actually by somebody that said. Just start at the bottom. Don't necessarily go to, you know, college or whatever. Not, there may not be anything wrong with those, but just start at the bottom. Go to the best place you can and start sweeping the floor. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Right, tax on bras discriminates against women. That's according to the Society of Radiographers. We're going to hear that uh, more about that today. It's at their annual conference and delegates there will argue how brassiers are crucial for women's health and should be VAT free, uh, claiming that it is discriminatory under the Equality Act. Well, joining us now to discuss this is Julie Blanc. She's founder of the Bra Consultancy. Good morning to you. Um, this is a new one on me. I hadn't really thought about it. I suppose there's an argument, isn't there, that if you've got VAT on these really important items essential, of clothing, yeah. essential items of clothing, then people might go for the cheaper option. And we know how ill-fitting bras can actually lead to lots of problems, either musculoskeletal or, in some cases, if the underwires are cutting in and things, it could even lead to increased risk of, of breast cancer. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Um, most people tend to guess um, when they buy a bra or they come to a local independent, you've got the knowledge there, we can advise them what the right bra is for them, their breast health, their size. Um, I think when people go and try and battle through themselves, they um, are hung up about the size, so they don't want to go to a, a, a G or an H, um, they want to stay at a C and a D, and their wires in the wrong place. So it's all about good breast health, and that's what as us as independents promote. Uh, I'm seeing the display behind you there, Julie. Isn't the danger that brassiers may well have been sexualized um you know from the point of view that it's all about how they look as to as opposed to what they do or don't do um not well it's like you wouldn't put your feet in badly fitting shoes but ladies put 
their breasts in badly fitting bras all the time. Um, so that's how I would say the analogy is really, um, because it should be, a, it's a foundation garment, so it makes it look good under your clothes, but it's also got to be comfortable. The wire's in the right place if it's a wired bra. But, um, you know, it's, it's about the good fit, but mainly the comfort and the good breast health. It certainly um, seems to be a growing trend is, is tackling these um, perhaps um, discriminatory VATs. There was triumph in January this year on period pants and then we had obviously tampon tax as well. And it's interesting when you, when you read into it, there are lots of goods and services obviously subject to VAT. I think we pay 20%, don't we, at the moment? Well, exemptions include books and newspapers, children's clothes and toys, motorcycle helmets, um, bras are classed as garments at the moment, so you have to pay 20%. And so if you're buying a £40 bra and if that VAT was removed you'd only have to pay £32. How hopeful are you that you might get this change? Well definitely it's bringing up awareness um, and obviously if the VAT is then um, taken off it makes the garment a lot cheaper obviously so then people could buy more garments good fitting garments as opposed to cheaper garments because of their spend so it's only got to be a positive thing in my eyes that if the VAT is removed that will benefit and and bring awareness at the moment it's bringing awareness um to the industry so if the VAT is removed that would be a fantastic option for ladies well Let's let's hope it is and good luck with your, your work and your advocacy on that front, Julie. Thank you. Julie is the founder of the Bra Consultancy. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yesterday I, I went out with somebody and, um, and I said to this guy, I said, Would you fancy some fish and chips? And we ordered um, fish and chips and we um, and two Coca-Colas, mm -hmm. right? And the bill came to thirty-four pounds. Oh and I went, What? What? Yeah. £5.70 of it, when I looked at the receipt, was VAT. Really? I didn't get in charge yeah. VAT. VAT is an immoral tax as well. There's so, so many immoral taxes. So, so you spent so many immoral yeah. taxes. We are taxed to the hilt in this mm. country. It is absolutely incredible. Maybe Liz Trust yeah, had a point. Yeah, I was going to say. Maybe, maybe she did. <laughs> Watch her tonight, 7 o'clock. She's with uh, Nigel Farage. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow from 6. Yeah. Thanks for Up watching next, today. next, Andrew and Bev, they'll have that ruling on Catherine Burbel Singh. See you tomorrow. A brighter outlook with Box Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Another fresh start out there this morning. Many of us seeing sunny spells. There will be a few showers, but it's not as many, not as heavy as the ones we saw yesterday. Still, it's a bit of a wet start over parts of Lincolnshire down through East Anglia. A fair few showers scattered across Wales as well. We'll see more coming into northern Scotland through the day. Still a fairly brisk breeze, but not as blustery, not as gusty as yesterday. We should see some decent spells of sunshine over parts of North Wales. Uh, northern England and southwest Scotland. Temperatures still struggling a little bit, feeling fresh in that breeze, but generally with a bit more sunshine, the wind's a little lighter than yesterday. It does feel a little warmer, or it certainly will do by this afternoon. Going to turn quite chilly overnight, though. More showers packing.